Durham and Darlington. Okay. That was back in about 94. That was that, that was fantastic up there. Yeah. And I love you Northerners. Better than us Southerners. We were, <laughs> I mean, we, we ain't got a chip on our shoulder. Yeah. We've got a fucking bag of spuds. We have. Everyone look. I'm trying to, I'll say to Bella, <laughs> you're going to know, uh, by the way, Mark, I'm going to know, you're, Bella will probably get, me- going. You know, Bella will probably get mentioned a lot here because I've got a friend of mine, Emery, <laughs> and he, because, uh, you know, uh, so if we want she saved my life. She made me a better person from day one. This little girl's been born. She saved my life and probably saved a lot of people's lives. But if you met my mate, Emily, always go, no, didn't realise you had a daughter. Because you don't mention them enough times, do you? But it was like saying when I was up north, you know, it's great up there, great up north. But I'm glad so- he loves northerners. Yeah, I love. I mean, we went to Turkey. Let me, let me introduce you. This is Dominic Negus. And <laughs> if you've not seen his. Danny Dyer's Deadliest Men episode. Don't, this, that, was it De- Danny Dyer's Deadliest Dustbin Men? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I recommend it. It is available online and it's a hard hitting story that peaks with an attempted axe murder on yeah, Dominic. Yeah, yeah. So we are yeah, going to yeah. be getting to that. Yeah. All I right. thought you might. I, thought, I don't know why you might have pulled out, but uh, everyone seems to like that bit. So. <laughs> But thank you very much for coming on, Dominic. No, thanks for having me, mate. Um, thank you. Jamie speaks very high. I love you, Jamie Boyle. We've been working with him a lot. Brilliant, brilliant author. Coming through. He's really coming through now. And so. he's written a book about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. Feel a bit sorry with Jamie. Could put a lot of time and effort in and come out about a year and a half ago. In the Amazon thing, went in at number one, done really well. Just when I was supposed to be flying eye, I, I just cut the cord and everything. I disappeared. Only because I had a few personal things going on. I had uh, I had some boys I was training like we had some we had a really good camp like with fires for Frank Warren didn't want to do it my way so I told him well, off basically part of part of, and we had to swear or we're not or trying to keep the swearing down sorry uh, yeah I, t- I wanted to do it my way didn't want to do it my way and I just cut the call on everything and it was a bit hard for me about a year and a half ago because I struggled a little bit. I had some pals of mine, they were doing a roofing. I was just born a tool years ago. I said, Dom, come back to work, mate. Come back to work. You got get off. I mean, one thing you one thing about my work ethics, you can't, you won't stop me. I'm a grafter. So I went back on the tools and then it life just ch- turned over the last year and a half. I got myself back on top, even financially, which is great. All the right way. All the right way. And I'm working, you know, I'm work really hard now. I look after a, a friend's house of a night, a few nights a week. Uh and I, I look after this hostel five days a week, and through loyalty, I'm I'm very lucky. He's paid. He's come through. I mean, I've got my two my, my two closest friends I've could ever ask for. My mate Bryn and my mate Emery. Uh, they're both. I'm very lucky. They're both Bella's godfathers. Again, did I mention I've got a daughter? <laughs> Just <laughs> uh, and I and I work for both of them, which I couldn't uh, I couldn't ask for better people to work for, because all I've ever wanted to I suppose is be part of something. That's all I've ever wanted, you know. Well, well, before we get to your hard-hitting crime stories, <laughs> where did you grow up and what was it like? Uh, listen, I was born in Bethnal Green, but I was lucky enough to be, uh, we were brought up in Essex, Woodford, in Essex, me and my brother, with my mum and dad, which I'm, I, uh, you know, a bit sad to say they've both gone now. Mum, Mum's been gone nine years in February. Dad's been gone 17 years in, um, was it March, I think? So I, shouldn't, I should know that. But yeah, Dad would have been 100 this year on the 26th. He would have been 100. He had me when he was 50. Proper old school grafter. Worked on a print. <coughs> if I can be half the man that he was, I'll be a lucky man. Because he didn't have nothing to do with nothing naughty. He was just a straight gay man. Worked all his life to look after his wife and two kids. And yeah, we were quite lucky. Brought up in Woodford. Uh, normal thing at school. Aided school. Got picked on at school. Uh well, so, you know, I left school at fifteen. So oh. a lot of a lot of people then get into martial arts and boxing because they were bullied. Would you say that was the case with you? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But I was always intrigued with the boxing. I mean, I remember going down to the gym. I was about eleven or twelve. Dad took us down there. It was Garden City ABC, which then changed the Gator. Who I eventually went back to when I was about twenty and boxed for him. And I remember being eleven years old, you know, tubby little kid with glasses, getting punched in the nose, thinking, I don't like this. I've always been sitting indoors playing with my Lego and my, and my Star Wars figures. You know, I love Star Wars, by the way. Can't be, the original. There's only three Star Wars. Star, was it Star Wars? Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. The rest of a load of old rubbish. But anyway, yeah, so... <coughs> yeah, but I, and I didn't like it. But also, I got about 15, 16. And I, did, I was doing karate then. I've done really well with that. Um, then I went back to boxing. I went to a gym in Leightonstone, which was right around the corner from where I was working. It was about... I think it was about... No, it was about... Yeah, 18. I was training there, got round some boys there. 
uh, little crew from Chink, they're all good fighters. Mate, mate there called Mark Wilson, still a power today. Bobby Wilcox, his name is, he's a bit of a bit of a character from the East End. But they all taught me to box. And then I was saying, Dom, you're wasting your time here. And then I eventually went back to Gator, box for them. Then I left Gator, went to Five Star ABC, which I hooked up with a, a Lenny Butcher. Uh, and then we done really well. We, we bought, uh, was it one of the North East Divs a few times, box for England, box for London. You know, then we turn pro, and then you got this name, the Milky Bar Kid. What's what's that story? Well, I'm not going to take my trousers off because I don't. I know I was going to wear <laughs> me, me new pants today, but I, tell you, I don't wear pants. But I've got anemic white legs, uh, and I used to wear. As you said, wear glasses. Well, I used to have glasses as a kid, and uh, <laughs> and then yeah, from there that the name stuck. When we went pro, we had this thing we were chucking at the Milky Bars, and uh, it seemed, it seemed to stick with us a little bit. So it was a little gimmick. Um, I don't think Nestle's were too happy about it, though, you know. <laughs> I think they tried to sue us once, but I had nothing to sue, so <laughs> were you going to take nothing out of nothing? But, um, yeah, no, it, and that's all right, stuck in the nickname, and it, yeah, it's quite funny, really. I try not to be uh, too serious about myself anymore, Good. and I've got that now. I've got that yeah. one. It's taken me 50 years, but I've got it now. <laughs> so, but, uh, no, it's, it's all cool. The boxing career, I mean, I love boxing, and you know, I was always... I was a better street fighter than I ever was. And just people say to me before, they're going to me, well, I thought he's supposed to discipline you, give you more discipline for outside. I said, no, it just made me better. You know, I'd have her outside. I'd go, ping, ping, ping. It was, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to big myself up that way because this the whole point of this interview is perhaps I was saying to the lads earlier, this is for me, it's not going to confession, trying to get a few <laughs> things off the chest. But it's like, you know, I've never, never condoned what I ever did outside. You know I mean? I was just a bit of a loose, loose cannon back then. So Lessons learned. Yeah, hard lessons. We Again, me and Bella were just saying this on the way here. We always told there's an easy way and an hard way. I'm always going to do it the hard way, I'm afraid. You know? So you took that skill set to work on the doors. How, yeah. did, how did you get on the doors? <laughs> Loved it. Um, but I was this curly-haired kid with glasses, 19 years old. And I was, you know, again, the boys that on the... We used to work at a place called The Venue at New Cross. And there was a fella there, good, really still a good friend of mine to this day, a fella called Terry O'Neill, lives out in Australia now. And uh, he said, Dom, you're getting wasted here. You're, you know, you, oh my God, you're, you you can fight. And he said, you know, and I said to him one day, he said, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I said to him, just tell him, i going to join a boxing club. And he's like, really? And a couple of people going, he's, he's never going to do nothing. He's never going to do nothing. Do nothing. Didn't do too bad. ABA titles. England vests, box for London, didn't do nothing. And they're the people that are jealous. I worked so hard. I worked so hard. Listen, I'm never going to be, well, I'm about 20 stone now. But I went up, you know, when I was boxing, I was 13 stone. When I went pro, I went to 14 stone. Then obviously I went to heavyweight. And you, you get, as you go to heavyweight, you get a bit lazy because you ain't got to cut things down there. But listen, I worked hard at that game. I worked every day of the week I was, I was training but it just helped me on the doors even more. And I loved doing the door work. We had some, you know, can I be honest with you, we didn't really have as much trouble. People think, oh, I probably, I must have had about one year, it was probably about 10 fights one year. That ain't bad, is it? I mean, but it ain't me. It ain't me. It's just, you know, people are drunk. You're just trying to behave themselves out. You know, the worst thing you can ever do is upset someone, especially a man when he's out with his girlfriend, because of egos and pride. You know, you talk, especially when you get someone who's a bit drunk or say, mate, you can't come in tonight, especially with their in, turns them into the lions, doesn't it? Because you don't want them, like, don't upset them, you know, or you don't want to be mugged off in front of their girls. And that's what happens. And that was the majority. The mad worst times you'd have was with the girls. I mean, because I'd, I'd, you know, I'd never touch a woman, you know, so. What was the, what was the cr craziest uh, door fights you had in the oh. I remember one, we were up, uh, we were up the Astoria one night and I wasn't working and my friend Johnny, Johnny Fast Hands, because he's got Fast Hands, you know. But he's, he was a guy I looked up to. So one day <laughs> they were having the steamers up in the bars. So he was downstairs on his own doing the front door and they would get called. So all the response team's gone upstairs and I'm just standing because he's my pal. And all of a sudden, he's, I remember that, that these guys were trying to leave and these were the steamers and he's gone to this, this guy, mate, you can't leave. And with that, he's off squared up to him also my mate hit this kid with a left hook and the way he'd done it John he's probably one of the nicest left hooks I've seen he's pinged him he's gone up and he slid down and all of a sudden they jumped on him from nowhere and all beating him up and my John will, if he, my mate John will tell you now if he's there and all of a sudden he goes he was so mad he's getting kicked about a bit and all of a sudden he goes he felt it was getting lighter then lighter and of course it's me I'm grabbing everyone I'm trying to bash these and I had my glasses then and all of a sudden my glasses got lost and we had a fella <laughs> there her Archie his name was he's come running down and he was working with her and he tried to eat me with a torch I'm going Archie it's me mate it's me and he's going 
And he was a pop like uh, uh, a Jamaican guy. He used to be a bus driver, but he couldn't have her around. And he's going, oh, I'm sorry, Dom, I didn't recognise you. And he picked these glasses up. They're all mangled oh. like that. And I put these in so funny. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what a fan now, like like the likes of John and, and Terry. These people that I've known since oh, 30 years ago, we're still friends today. Because that's what you tend to find. When you, when you, you know, we might not see each other from, I've got another good pal of mine, John, Big John, Johnny Gardner. And, uh, we we he just texted me yesterday and it was really nice. So, some sorry, Dom ain't seen you in a while, but we know we're always gonna be there because we worked together for years, you know, like you know, it's when when you when the shit is the fan and you you know you know, you know your friends are then. And it's uh yeah, it, it's quite a quite an experience working on them doors sometimes. But so, so what would you say it takes to be a good doorman? And has that changed over the years with the introduction of cameras and everything yeah, else? Yeah, but do you know what I think you've got you've got to have a good attitude. I mean, me, I was always quite lucky because I'll be even now. I'm not very good at talking. I'm, I know you've got to be a bit surprised here, <laughs> but in certain situations, I'm, I mean, I'll, I'll clam up a little bit. Yeah. And I wasn't there for the talking. I was there. I was like your battleship. You know, you'd have people, again another good pal of mine, Matty, Matty Austin Cooper. His name is. Uh, he was he was telling us once. He was a good looking guy. Well, he's a good looking guy. Now, bodybuilder, had a ponytail. This is like uh, uh, 91, 92, and it just seemed you think, oh, don't want to mess about with him. But and, uh, Matt, and I'm being honest with you, sorry, Matt. He couldn't fight for kittens, but he could talk. And he'd, mind you, grab if he bear hugged you in trouble. And he'd, he'd have these little hands, right? But he didn't say, and they'd just swell up. And he said, look at the size of them things. You know what I mean? But he'd have these little girl hands, and was such a good-looking bloke. All the girls loved him. And there's me, just a like, oh, dopey old Dom sitting there like that. And as soon as he'd go, he'd go, I'd be straight in there, bang. He said, well, he didn't have to fight because he had me there for him. And I was, I was his game kid because I wanted being bullied. I wanted this reputation, didn't I? I wanted this, you know, because I was bullied and I hated that. And, you know, and also I was the first there trying to show you what I could do. And in some ways, I probably made matters worse, really, because I wanted this reputation. You know, like, you see these new kids on the block, when they got the old, you know, like the old war horse on the door, they're always trying to prove, like, they're as good as you and things like that. But I think what you need nowadays, because of the, the camera situation, you need to you need to be able to talk to people. There's a... Uh, Century, Centauri, I think there's a company out there for Essex. Uh, Steve Pembury, his name is. Now, I've worked with him and he's done some work for me. Now, that's that's the thing of a good doorman. I, he, he can talk people down. He can see his situation. And all their boys on that firm are top-notch guys. I'm not trying to sell it. I'm just telling you how it is. <laughs> I mean, I've worked with some really good companies like Man Security up in Birmingham. Worked with them for years. Still do bits now. Headline Security, Steve Ed. Great companies. But I just think... Everybody brings a different thing to the table. Back in the nineties, not you could get away with murder, but it was more you had to be more hands on, if you, you know if you know what I mean. And then obviously things change, the camera situation come in. Um and then everything change, you can't do this, you can't do that. But what always annoys you, and I see it all the time, especially I don't go to pubs or clubs any anymore, because they're they're like I've had to sit down and do a lot of work on myself. Well, people have helped me. And it's called the arena. And my arena is always going to be a pub, a club where there's booze out, like alcohol, drugs. I'm, I'm the, I'm lost of the gladiators. I'm going to, sh I'm going to, I'm like a, I'm like a peacock. I'm coming in, Dom's here. And, and they're for me now. They're no good for me. But in where you see nowadays where the drugs and especially drugs, anywhere there's booze, there's drugs. You can't help it. And that's why, you know, it's, it's getting more and more, I don't know, iffy or whatever to work on doors now. You know, the, you know, ain't very nice out there now, is it? I mean, everything seems to have changed now. You know, people are more spiteful now. There ain't no uh, morals now, is there? I don't think, you know, back in the day, I mean, I was quite, don't, you know, you know, clip you, I'll be all right kind of thing. But people, they're, they're trying to finish you now. They, you know, there ain't no, you know, to knock him out, leave him alone. He was getting kicked in the head and losing teeth. And there are gangs around to the teeth these days, aren't they? You can't, I said, when I worked down this hostel in Ridley Road in, in Acne, it's proper one of the naughtiest areas in London. Every other day, someone's getting stabbed out in the market, or not such in the market, but the top in the market, bottom in the market. Someone's getting, and they, and they, at Top Boy, they, it, it, you know, I've done everything this thing, Top Boy, it was filmed around there. And it is naughty there, but I mean, like, unless you're involved in that kind of, Situation. They normally leave you alone. They're not interested. I mean, it, it, I mean, I'll start working down this market, 
and because the sauce was in the middle of the market, and I didn't like it. But now everyone knows you, and everyone knows you're part of the market. And I love it in the morning. I walk down there, mate. Right, well, I mate. And I always call you big man. Hey, big man. Big man. <laughs> I walked down there the first time. What while I'm walking back, and then little group they're going feds. It's the feds. And I stood there. I went, mate. Can't do your own work. Am I a fed? Come on, you know what I mean. But it is. Uh, yeah, but it's very interesting because you can see how hard life is down there. And these these kids down there will they're not bang, they'll take your life just like that. So you've got to be a little bit you've got to be a little, little bit respectful. Is it fear? Is it no no because don't we all want a quiet life? I think we all want a quiet life, don't we, So Well I do now. I do now. So. <laughs> Yeah, we've interviewed some ex-cops, and they say because drugs are illegal, the black market gets bigger every year. So young people are just tempted into it, and they they get the knives, and whoever the, whichever gang is the most violent takes over the territory. Yeah, and I can see that. It's like an incentive for it. We have that where we are, and it's such a shame because some of the kids there. I'm not supposed to speak to one of the lads out there. He's a lovely, you know. I was saying, I said it the other. I said, good-looking guy. Oh my God, he's intelligent. This kid's intelligent. And it's like, and I said to him, what do you, what do you want to do with your life, mate? Yeah. I said, because I'm only telling you, not that I was, listen, well, you've done your own work. I mean, drugs was never my thing, never has been, never will be. But I was always involved with the, the violence, if you know, you know what I mean. And so when I was talking to him, I said, but what do you want? Because you're going to end up dead or in prison, mate. And it's such a waste. And he's, such, and he's an intelligent guy. And it, and it you know, like if I, I wish I could help people like that. That's what I'm saying. Doing these things. No way am I ever going to sit here condone what I've done. Because if I get my point across to a few people, go, do you know what? There's better things out there. You know, I said again, when my daughter was born, I walked out of my house. And my old lady used to get the ump with me. I walked out and go, you can smell the grass. You know, I feel the rain. Because I was so selfish back before she came. I did whatever I wanted. I wanted that. I'm going to get that. I want that. You give me the money. You know, and I become a bit of a, I become a bit of a knob, to be honest with you. But that, yet, you know, so with the violence, it was always because I was that quick to be violent. That's why people left me alone. So, so we've had a few classic doorman stories from Frenchie, from Steve Rafe, and from other people. All good boys. All yeah, good boys, and, all and they've said there's always been a situation whereby people have come back like 20, 30 strong. Yeah, and yeah. they've had like a huge battles. Did that, have, that ever happen in your career? We, we were once uh, saying that uh, the Astoria again, that was quite the naughtiest place we've ever worked. Like, for me, it was. It was like they used to have, like, the, and I put it, I'm just saying, like, the Black Knights. It'd be like that kind of, uh, you know, like the Acid Knights. And it'd be like, I remember we, we had a bit of a, a thing on the door. We chucked half a dozen people out. And all of a sudden, come near the end of the night, they were waiting across the road. There must have been about 30 of them. And I always remember the police come, they all, like, section it all off and the police went you're really lucky I mean I was just a game kid yeah. and it was like we went opposite the story there used to be uh, what's it called the, the thingy centre I can't remember what it's called uh, centre point mm. and they had a big fountain outside and when they said the police go go and have a look what's in that fountain and they, when the police turned up there was machetes and night when they did the police come they chucked all the, I mean listen I, I was just a game kid don't get me wrong yeah I come um, you know I won't say I haven't used weapons and you know as life got on, they all seem to be involved. But I mean, I was just wanting, I mean, I was like, was it Roberto Duran, Manor of Manor? Like, man, you know, I thought that was how we were going to be. We're the toughest one survives. But I me, mean, that's why I'm very much a Neanderthal. I still believe in that. Yeah, okay, I'm, I still think I'm, yeah, of course I'm going to look after myself. But I so said, where my dad taught us, I grew up looking up to Lenny McLean and Roy Shaw. These are the people I grew up in. Roy, he done the forward to my first book. And he, you know, I could say he was my friend. We went out a few, went out quite a few times, had some great nights. So how was I going to be any different? Well, I thought, we're going to, we're going to fight, we're going to have your hands. But it ain't like that nowadays. You get these little, little kids, you look at them, you give them a backhand and they're going to go over. Next minute they're going to come back and just stab you. Or they'd even shoot you nowadays, wouldn't they, for, for nothing, for nothing. I mean, you know, you keep being about these people, like you give them, you know, back in the day, you know, like you could get, you know, who knows what hit is. But I mean, it's like, you're talking lots of money. Nowadays you're going to get a crackhead to go and kill someone for hundred pounds, wouldn't you? Yeah. We had um, Gary Shaw on here, Roy Shaw's son. Yeah, Gary, on, on Gary's a good man. I haven't spoke to him in a yeah. while, but he was, he's a tough boy, Gary. Gary's yeah, a tough boy. Yeah, definitely. But listen, it's an odd one to follow in his, in his dad's footsteps there, ain't it? You know, like you got Roy and you got Gary. I watched a video about his stories in Malta, the dad. Yeah, oh, was, when, he went in, when he went into the, the nightclub, <sighs> weren't I sat and the bloke got me to flip the table up. But, yeah. <laughs> but, Roy, but, but to me, that's what Roy was. I mean, we could go, you got a true gentleman. Could never ask, I mean, we've been out 
Low Sun is me, Roy, and like with Vic, we go out because there's that's Vic Dark. Yeah, Vic Dark. Yeah. Like, they're, yeah. they're, but they're just gentlemen. You go out. Uh, what I love about now, Vic and and Roy, they'd always wear suits. Always, we you know we go. So we used to go to the country club. Me and me and Vic, you know, they always look so smart, yeah. so smart manners, impeccable manners. And that's why, you know, certain things rub off. And that's why, uh, you know, I don't think manners cost nothing now. Well, they, they do nowadays, don't they? Because no one's got no manners. That's a really good lesson as well, yeah. Yep. yep. So on the doors then, what kind of injuries, what was like the worst injury or worst scenario you in? Were you, were you actually ever worried for your life? On, on, oh, no, we doors? had a couple of things. Obviously, we had, you know, I remember a pal of mine, like Big Johnny was working at a, a place in um, Chinkford. A bloke turned up in a car and he and he point, pulled the gun out, pointed the gun. John being John, just run at the geezer and the geezer drove off. I mean, these things when people are going to shoot, you ain't going to see it coming. You know, they're just going to walk up and we've learnt, you know, going, I think we've learnt the hard way. I mean, the, most of the damage I used to get was to my hands because we were eating people and things like that. But again, not so, we were quite lucky. The, when we used to work in a firm called Top Card, we had a great team. We had a fellow there called John Novo. He was there, couldn't ask for a better man on the door, going with Terry O'Neill. We had a fellow called Paddy. He was Irish, but he used to box for Ireland. He, he was, so, you know, we had we had some good guys again with Matty and things like that. And we had a great little team there that we all become really close. Yeah. And it was like even now we we speak to. I said I mentioned Terry earlier. He came over from Australia a couple of years ago, and we met at Winter Wonderland, and he so made my day because we were still close as we were back then. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we're, again, the damage I used to do. I mean, yeah, okay, you going with a few lumps and bumps. We took over this the venue at Newcross, and it was like a working man's club. So they changed into this studio and it, it's still going now where they do like a lot of ba indie bands. <laughs> like they used to have bands like uh, <coughs> Carter, I don't know if you remember Carter, USM, back in the day, uh, in the 90s, the Levelers, things like that. That was that kind of indie music. I used to love it. You know, they, their kind of music was like the Pixies, Red Hot Chili Peppers, things like that, The Farm. And it, that was my kind of music. So I used to get paid to work in a nightclub. I used to actually love going to anyway. But in the, the trouble we had there the first six months when they changed it over was that they tried to let the, the regulars back in but let them know look this isn't a this working man's club and it was like a proper working man's club so within the first we used to have to fight them in, in, and that, that was you know we used to have some battles there but then they were quite good where it was like an Irish working man's club so we'd have, they'd have a bit of a ding dong with you and the next day they'd come and shake your hand and it was all done <laughs> it ain't like that nowadays because you have a ding dong with someone you've got to be they're going to come back the next day as you just yeah. said they'd come back you've got to be on the ball I mean, we're back then, I'm, I'm like the 90s, it's like 30 years ago. We didn't have metal detectors. We weren't really worried about knives and guns as such. Like, but nowadays, knives and guns, it's, it's every day now, isn't it? I mean, you, you get metal detectors in schools. How mad's that? You know, like you'd have respect for your teacher. If your teacher said you won't want to ring your dad, you know, you crap yourself. Now, the people, the teachers, they end up getting beaten up. You know, it's terrible. There's no respect there now, is there? Now I'm saying it like an old fart, you know. <laughs> so, you know yeah, no respect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it will. Yeah, so on your Danny Dyer, and I've watched your interview with Jamie Boyle as well, or Jamie Boyle talking about you. So one of the big things in your life then was the public fight in 2002 with Audley <laughs> Harrison. Old, ordinary, ordinary, yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah. How, how? what was that like? Listen, he was, listen, a little drink of water, so it was. Go for it. So in the link in the description box below this video is going to be all of the links to Jamie Boyle's stuff, his Amazon link. Uh, if you want to check Dominic's book out, go down there and you can just click on that and check it out. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean they they uh, <coughs> they come us with a fight. We were supposed to fight him. I come here. I think it might have been a year before, and I actually got a uh, food poisoning about oh I don't know it was about a week before, ten days before the fight, <coughs> and I was on fire. You know, so long and short, we had to pull out and show him the paperwork doctor, give us a sick note, because obviously they'd get another opponent in. You know, they dropped it on us about this fight. It gives, you know, a couple of, note, couple of months' notice. And I was so shocked I could beat this guy. I was so, don't think he's a big man. And I'll be honest with you, and if we, it's all that being being honest, you know, okay, I've got a bit of juice, you know, a bit, you know, and uh, it probably didn't do me no favours anyway. Well, no, it didn't do me no favours because I was carrying this extra muscle. I was normally about 15 stone. I come in at 17 stone and I was, you see, I mean, I was in proper good nick then. And, uh, but then what you don't realise, you've got a 15 stone arc, got to carry 17 stone geezer. And that's what, I mean, but I've got it now, all, all thing it all, Lee. Great, you know, great ambassador for the sport. Uh, 
good fighter. He, uh, definitely, the, you know, the better man won. And so, but even if I did win that fight, I wouldn't have deserved to have won it because obviously in my eyes, I cheated. And if you read the first book, it is a is an actual chapter talks about I, it didn't, if I did win, you know, it would have left a bad taste in my mind because I'm not like that. I know it's an outside in the car park car. I pull your eyeballs out. But in a ring, it's a little bit different. <laughs> See, in, the, in that ring, and what I noticed for a big guy, he was lovely quick hands and he had really really good footwork really good footwork but then and as the story goes you see in the third like the fourth round I'm getting a little bit tired and I think well used to 10 round fights but also because I'm carrying some, and also and you've watched it people go oh, knock me down he throws a straight left well I throw a straight right you watch it I watch it all the, well I don't watch it because it gives me the ump but as I throw the right and he parries it as he parries it watch I'm sort of going at the ropes and also and I take a knee now he was, he was right in the way because my glove never touched the floor. Then he takes two steps out. He sees me not to, and he walks back and hits me as hard as he can. But if this guy's going to hit so hard, why don't he knock me out? Why don't he knock me? Then that's when I got the ump. If you notice, then that's when it all sort of like went a bit bandy. I jump out, gums all comes out, bit of verbal. Isn't that but, an automatically disqualification? Well, no, I think John Lewis didn't want to because I was going mad. Yeah. So I, then I jump up, stick the nut on him, and then uh, he and the, the referee, great referee, he calms us down. I've got people in the crowd going, yeah, I said, well, yeah, you, you never you know what was, and I'm going, man, he calmed us down. Yeah. And then the fourth thing, you see, it changed the whole fight, though. It changed the whole persona of the fight. And I'm not saying I was beaten, but I got the better of him a little bit then, because it, it, rat, it rattled him a lot. Because now we're t- we're, it's my fight now. It's my fight now. But then I've got to say, <coughs> the better man won. And he, But we are going, we brought this up the other week. One thing I'd love to do, he, he don't give a toss about me, I'd love to sit down and have a coffee with him. Because out of that fight, I'm the one that got the press. He got so much bad press over it because there's me little chunky cruiserweight. All of a sudden, showing him like, you know, and all of a sudden, he's supposed to be this world champion material. But I, my dad was there then, and he was in his wheelchair. And we went to take to see him afterwards. And yeah, Phil Torrance, a great American trainer. He uh, he was training, uh, what was his name? Uh, Montel Griffin, the first geezer that beat Roy Jones Jr. But I remember he, he you know, anyway, so I went to see him. Like, fight's over, got my kit on, we're going, dad's with us. His pals, you know, it was like last, last of the summer wine. <coughs> We're going to the, I said, come, not to his dressing room. Hello, you're just going to come and say goodbye to the champ, you know, like you do. And he went, he don't want to see you. I said, you don't want to see me. I was supposed to make a mug. Then I went mad, you know, I went, oh, yeah. you know, but what hurts me is the fact, anyone wanted my dad to meet the Olympic champion. My dad was so made up. And of course, my dad died anyway. And so he can't put that right. But to him, it don't mean nothing. Does. It's just something else that's happened. But I'd love to sit down and, and put things right. To me, it's something on my my bucket list <laughs> but we had a fight years ago that's very you, you know what even mentioned we had a fight years ago 97 for the southern area title against a kid, a kid called Chris Emery and great fight when I think it was number four fight of the year it was but the, the story is last round I knock him out and he goes in a coma mm. so no, <clears throat> and they're going about all these other people that have done this and done it but poor old Chris always gets left like no, you know, there was another ca- guy out of his camp called Spence Oliver. He had the same thing exactly. So we had Jess Harding, <coughs> good heavyweight in his day. He actually managed Chris Emery and Spence Oliver. So I managed this for poor old Jess, and he's a lovely guy. And Spencer, they're my friends to this day. So we have this thing with Chris Emery. He goes over. He's in a coma. I can't. There's me. One of the champion. I should be jumping up and down. Typical me. Was it falling in a bucket? Bucket of tits coming out, sucking my thumb. You know, they're saying, you've got to be careful here. This kid's in a bad way. So I think it was two, three weeks later, Spencer's having his fight at Albert Hall. Bang, the same thing happens to Spencer. Talk about bad luck on Jess. But what I'm just trying to say, one of the hardest fights I've been with is Chris Emery. And that's another thing I'd love to do. Because since that day, I've never spoke to Chris. I went to the hospital a couple of times, but I didn't have the bollocks to go in to the wall. Because I'm still fighting, remember? And I don't know, is this going to... And it did to business. It was only... See, this is how mad I brought this up. It's only like the other week. I'm driving home from work, and someone put it on Facebook, This the poster. Chris Henry, I think Georgie Smith was on it. Julius Francis was fighting for the European title. We were like a joint top of the bill. So we had the first fight live on Eurosport. That happens. The ambulance comes. So that was when they only had one ambulance. So the whole show got cancelled. So, you know, going, this, this poster come up the other week, and I'm driving home from... From work, I had to pull over. It like, mm. felt like someone had chinned me. And it made me realise for all the years, was it 23 years ago, how much I put it to bed. I never thought about it. 
And it really, really, really messed my week up for a weekend up for a few days. It was only until I sat down with my mate and I spoke about it. He said, Dom, you've got to, you've got to forget about this, mate. We've got, we, you've come so far now. Mm. And it, is, it just makes you realise how dangerous this sport is. But again, if Chris is out there, mate, mate, there ain't, there ain't a lot of time I don't think about you, brother. You know, and it is hard. You know, it is hard because you know, I've known when we're doing what we were doing in the criminal world, yeah, people got hurt. But this was different. This was a sport. I know we had our... You know, we didn't, no one forced us in the ring, but you don't want to hurt no one. I never actually wanted, especially when I was boxing, never wanted to hurt anybody because I just wanted the titles, you know, that's all I was interested in. So looking back now, do you think that you would have been better off just staying in the boxing and going percent, into the underworld? Million percent, million percent. You know, Colin Hart put it in a thing. I took my eye off the prize. I got too busy getting a reputation, trying to be an hard man, and which really, you know, yeah, okay, listen, yeah, okay, I can have a fight, I can do this, I can do that. You know, but as you said, nowadays, the hard man thing ain't how hard, it's how spiteful you are. Yeah, you know, and uh, yeah, okay, uh, if I concentrate on the boxing, sorry, mate, uh, he's treading his foot there. If I concentrate on the boxing, yeah, I'll, you know, listen, I was well, well taught material. I'm not just saying it, you know, and it just, I've got to let, let everything take over kind of thing, you know, and it, it, and it ruined it for me, really. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, the thing with Audley Harrison, my friend, when it all come up, I remember I was in Tenerife and I get a phone call. Well, my, my manager gets a phone call from the border control saying there could be a shot for Dominic at the British title against Danny Williams in. And then they phone back, you know, because obviously the right to have a drugs test. And he come back and he went, nah, Dom won't be boxing for a while. So I knew I was I knew I was caught then. Mm. And, then and then I kept out of the way. And my, my friend, we had a we had a letter go, look, let's go to Wales. You know, you've got you got to go in front of the ball. Excuse me. You know excuse me, uh, and do this thing where he got thrown. I knew I was going to get a ban for a year, maybe two. And anyway, I said, nah, I was so militant. Now I'm going, yeah, they could all go, and my mate, we only talked about it the other day. He goes, I told you. I said, yeah, I know, mate, I know. I should have gone to the board, got me in. I mean, it took me 15 years to get my pro license to do the corners because after 15 years, I still had to pay the fine. They wouldn't let me do the corners until I paid the fine from 2002. You know, you don't even get that with a tax lot thing, do you, or whatever, you know. What I mean? but, mm. but I paid it, and it, you know, it was it was good. You know, it was, I suppose it was good to get that bit bit out of the way, you know. So, uh, so how were you recruited into the world of debt collecting, <laughs> and what was your first job? <laughs> oh, that, it's just really weird. It's like that door work, it all comes in hand in that. There's always mm. someone that wants something doing, and he wants that, or they want that, and. You know, the first, I couldn't really tell that. Like, you know, it's probably someone on a few quid for a bit of puff or something like that, I suppose. But that was, again, that was one of the things I really tried to keep out of was the drugs well, because there ain't no, uh, you know, there ain't no law in that game. You know, I've seen so many people get hurt because they ain't paid for this and paid for that. But, yeah, it was just, you know, it just seemed to come in. You know, there's always someone wanting a bit of muscle, weren't it? You'd just go on meets with people. You'd sit there and watch them have a mate. Like, you'd be sitting, I'd be sitting behind you. Then they'd be sitting there with their man, and it's, that's how it was. It was, you know. I mean, I'm not too proud of it. I mean, I'm also not proud, but I'm a different person now. And I mean, it's taken me 16 years again since my daughter's been born. Just even my outlook on life so different. I just don't want to get involved in anybody's egg anymore. Because that was the troubles I got it weren't my problems. It's everybody else's. You know, and that's why, I'd, you know, I seem to get, you know, I've got a bit of a bad name for that, I'm afraid. But I was very, I always felt like John Wayne, quick on the draw. And I was quick on the draw, you know what I mean? It's not, I wouldn't say I've beaten better men, but I was just quicker than them. And I, one thing I realised, I was going to touch wood, if I eat on your chin, and I'll eat on the chin, mate, tell her, you are gone, mate, I could, oh, I could get out of there as quick as I can. I was never one to admire my work, put it like that. That's when you see people getting nicked. They always have a fight, they go, do it, and the police come up, and they're still standing there. Now I'll be home, I'll be home having a cup of tea or something, I'll be done, done what I had to do. <laughs> So on Danny Dyer, he did the demonstration where oh, you and your crew go in. But that was supposed to be, do you know what kills me? Like, Danny's a good man. And to me, he mugged us off a little bit. But that's how, listen, I was never, I was never there. I was never a guy, you, you're so surprised me, a good talker. Put him in a, a confrontational situation. I'm not good at talking because I'm thinking, we're ever going to do something or we're not. You know, we had like things there with certain people. We're going to debt. I was never the talker. My pal or whatever. I'm not going to say who it was, but he'd, he'd take my pal would have the thing. He'd always have a baseball camera. He'd take his out off and rub his head. Well, that was the cue for me to stick one on you. And that was it. And that's, and that's how we worked, you know. And it's, but as you find with the debts, again, having people like, well, you know, you know, worked whatever, whatever we did, like, you know, I've got, so I was really like, I worked, I was taught by the master. Like, I was with Vic, weren't I? You know what I mean? It's like Vic, Vic pulls a lot of respect. 
But then with Vic, it was, Vic was a good negotiator. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't always about finance. You know, don't get me wrong, it, as you said earlier, if the if you turn up someone's house and you knew there was me and Vic and someone up and you think, yeah, that's a tidy little firm there. But you didn't have to, you know, we, we were like, uh, I don't know, like bank people would go, well, okay, you know, okay, you own X amount of money. Oh, well, we'll get you on the phone. As soon as you got the phone, it was, you know, well, can you pay this? Great. Out of, out of debts, we, we, it wasn't down to violence. We were, back in the day, like you turn up, break people's legs. That's a load of old rubbish. Because <laughs> they're going to break someone's so legs. He can't go to work the next day, can he? And then also, he can't get no money. And it's, but again, Vic was so good at talking to people. And I think that that was, you know, that rubbed off a little bit as I got older. Again, it was never about, you know, you get someone, you turn up at someone's house and they go, look, you own, you own John, I don't know, so 10 grand. And they go, yeah, but, but John's my best mate. I said, well, you can phone him up then. And all of a sudden, you get the phone, right, speak to him now. You put the phone over, and before you know, they're talking to each other again. And a lot of it is people get, get in debt because they can't afford to pay the money back. And then what makes it worse, then they're embarrassed. And then, then they turn their phones off. But then you get a lot of people, they're whatever they're into, <laughs> all of a sudden they might own 10, 20 grand to someone. They ain't the same got the money. Then they're going on holiday with their wife and kids. And sometimes you've got to really in a big, oh, look, I own these people the money. Let's pay the money back first, you know, and then and so it is. It's, you know, it's a, it is a funny old game, as they say. But so showing up at someone's house then, where potentially a person could have weapons. Yeah, yeah. You you you, you don't know who else is in the yeah, house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> did you get off on that? Are you were you an adrenaline junkie back then, or did you like a survey little... the house and no, make sure no, there's listen. no one in there and shit? <laughs> the kind of things yeah. I ever did. I was so crash bang wallop. That's why I think we got away with, like, not again, got away. We weren't dealing with straight going people. They're like, whoever watches this, they're going to go, oh, they didn't go out of the place. These people weren't people to go out of the place because they were doing something naughty themselves. I mean, it'd be like, I was I was so, um, I, was, I was saying, you know, crash back. I mean, I'd just go, you know, all right, he owns the money, well, go around, right, knock at the door, straight in. So we didn't have a chance to set anything up. Yeah, I remember a couple of times we went up, but people were going, were so quick. You know, if you want to have a fight, we'll have a fight. That's not, but that's what I'm getting paid to do. But nine times, when you bring violence to someone's, a lot of times we got, not, again, we didn't get away with nothing because there was nothing to get away with. We were just trying to, we were like Robin Hood. We were only trying to put things right. And it was like, so we turned up people's houses and it was like, you know, you own the money. And straight away they go, uh, yeah, well, there you go, then bang, we got you. So what, well, you want to have a fight because you own this person money? And okay, then that's when I'd get involved, well, I was getting involved. But then nine times out of ten, the, the situation was sorted out there and then because once they admit to owning the money, then we could sit down and work out how they were going to pay it back. I mean, this is me talking about this because it's not really, it's been years since I spoke about any, again, I've not been out of the game for years, you know, and it, and it is funny, and like you sit there and think, oh, yeah, you remember when that happened? Oh, yeah, do you remember? And sometimes you think, yeah, I remember when that happened as well. So, but it's, it, it's like nine times out of ten, the people paid the money back. You might have to go back and rattle their cages occasionally or keep on top of them. And, but then there was people would go and do debts for and go and get the money. And then they asked us to go and get their money back from the next people. And it's just funny how this world is. It is, it is I mean, there's so many dogs out there that you could, they would tell you to your face, I promise I'm not, I promise it. I promise, yeah, okay. And you... You could listen. I'm I'm all for the underdog. I always <laughs> always wanted to believe in the good in people, but then also there come a time where we turn and my mate just rub his head and he didn't care what he's, he's getting the right hand or ain't he? So and some people didn't care about their money. They said, "Look, don't worry about the money. Just going to go smacking the mouth for us." So that was easy for me. Then I got talked to everybody. So. Yeah. so I imagine that it did run smoothly mostly. But perhaps there was the odd occasion where something went wrong in the house. Are you able to talk about anything like that, or would that get you in trouble? Not really, but I remember being at an house once, and the geezer tried to whip my mate with a bit of wood. <laughs> so, no, and I'm going to say it was, but he pulled the wood, and he, and he owned the money. Well, the mad thing was, in the end, it turned out this fella didn't own the money. He already paid it, but the fella, that he had the hunt with him. So I remember my mate, and I always remember I went to shake his hand, but as I went to shake his hand, I went to put my left hand, because my mate's gone mad. I said, no, no, look, calm down, calm down. He's like, oh, I'll sort it out. And I went to shake his hand with my left. And he didn't, because it was so, as, he, as I went to shake his hand, he didn't realise, because as he put his left hand out, I went with the right. And that, that was, you know, time to go then. So I mean, we've been chased out of houses by dogs and things like that. People said, dogs onto us. People pull guns, like, get out of my house. And it's not a lot, unless you front it, you've got to stand in front of it, and that's what you do, don't you? I mean, he said, well, you're going to shoot me, you better shoot me then. But then it's like, then they go, well, I don't want to shoot you, but I don't want you. I said, okay, but you're going to sort it. Yeah, I'll sort it. Get, you know, 
people that pull guns, who are going to use them or they're not? My dad taught me one thing. Someone, that's why now, I've never ever carry nothing on me because my dad taught me, if you pull something, you've got to use it. Any times you want that, then you know what? Nine times out of ten, you can you can get the job done. But then it was like, oh, again, I don't carry anything anymore. I'm making sure that. But yeah, we've turned up ours. He's been chased out by dogs. You know, you get people going, we know who you are, things like that. I said, well, you know, I'm, I ain't got nowhere. I'm still here. So. so we've interviewed Brian Cockrell, taxman, two times. Oh, yeah, I think yeah. he said, if someone pulls a gun, I run at them. Yeah. If they pull a knife, I run the other way. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's your, what, do you have a protocol well, no, if someone pulls a gun? I'd, I'd go with that. But, I mean, I, I remember years ago, a, a fella pulled a... Well, it wasn't a knife, it was a bottle. He smashed a bottle and he came at me with a bottle. And I remember I remember the geezer coming at me and I'm backing up, which, which, back first time. And there's a second time, as he went with a knife, I've hit him with this left hook, and it's probably the best leap that I could have ever asked for. Put it like that, I needed it. And but it was just over saying so stupid. And it like me thinking, I was with a pal of mine, he, he got he got cut really bad about two years before I'd all about 80 stitches in his face. And that's all I kept thinking. I'm going to my mate, throw my coat. There's, I've watched these films, haven't you? You wrap your arm up in a coat, you're gonna stand and you hit him with that. And I thought, no, nah, just give me a better room, give me a better room. And yeah, it's like, yeah, them knives, I don't like knives, you know. Yeah, they hurt a little bit, you know what I'm saying? So, no, I, and, and and I'm not I'm not really particular to axes either. So I'm a bit allergic to them. But uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just saying like Brian, you know, I've, no, I've heard of Brian. You know, what I mean, I've, like you know, Brian and who's it? Like Lee Duffy, Viv Graham, all them boys from up little tough little firm they were back in the day. And uh, yeah, Brian, yeah, he's he's a unit. He's only so. You really want to want him knocking at your door? For you. <laughs> At least once ever chip bay, he's he's won't wear my ass anytime. Come and see the chip bay. Anything else, I'm, I won't be in. So. <laughs> yeah, and Brian has just started his own YouTube channel. So if you're out there watching this, check out Brian's YouTube channel as well. Yeah, don't upset that man. Don't want him knocking at your door. <laughs> so you said you did some karate then. In karate, yeah, they karate. they teach you how to like grab someone who's oh, got a weapon. My, you always remember. <laughs> always, mom, we were going through this. Uh, this course is all that knife attacks. And you don't, the geezer's coming out with a knife like that. So I remember going home. I was only about 16, 17 then. I just got into it. And anything, anything to do with contact, I loved it. But I remember, so my dad's saying, well, I said, Dad, make out you've got a knife. And he's got this knife. He's going, well, can't I said, no, no, Dad, you've got to come like this. I said, no, but what? And it was so funny because the only thing I found with karate is all set moves. You had to do this, was that, and it was that. But my dad goes, well, he been in the arm. He's going, oh, I'm going to come at you like this. And anybody that knows how to use an off, they're normally every day in the back there, or they're going to come at you like that. They're going to slash you. They're not nine times, and they ain't going to, unless they've got the right answer, just going to eat you. Because you can block them kind of basic moves. But no, it was, it was funny how like, a lot of them moves that you see in, ain't worth a toss, you know. But I'm quite lucky, but getting on the cry, I'm quite I'm really close with a, to one called Joe Long, who's really working on with the UFC and there's another there for called uh, Paul Alderson Aldo now when I got in the cry he was the man he was like we would keep most still kids a little bit older than, like, he was world karate champion and stuff like that you want to see this kid even that was my age and I'm and I hate to say but because he's probably one of the only people I've seen in action like on the mat or in the dojo that I was in awe of and I always wanted to be like Paul this guy was amazing but now if you want it, Paul, I'm waiting for your son. But no, he's, we're really close. He's such a nice, nice guy. But he taught me loads of stuff. And I used to watch this guy. He'd do all these somersaults and spinning kicks. And I mean, that was proper cry. Yeah. But again, I found a lot of the cry stuff never really was good outside. Very basic. Now, don't get me wrong, please. I'm not asking like people come and offer me. I don't mean that. But just saying, I remember when I moved up, I moved up to uh, Newcastle and I got into Muay Thai. And a lot of the stuff, then that's a dangerous sport. Elbows, knees, coming in close, grappling. And I got really into that. I loved it. I loved it, you know what I mean? And because well, I was really good at the boxing, my boxing game made me even better with the Muay Thai boys. I mean, I could fend them off with a jab and come up with a little kick. And I mean, listen, I'd be lucky to kick a football nowadays, you know what I mean? I said, last time you see me running, was in the ice cream ran rent pass, you know what I mean? <laughs> 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 Two ball, scoop ball. But no, it's like, yeah, I mean, the, I love uh, anything to do with contact. I love the karate. Love, met, met, again, met some great people there. I mean, like, I was, God, that's about 34 years ago. I was doing that. And that, that Paul was still close now. Again, Joe Long, he was he was a top karate man back in the day. There's other guys out there, Trevor Bailey. You know, they, they had some big shows on there. Trevor, that's a, that's a dangerous man there. Like, he can really look after himself, that guy. You know, and again, we were just lucky. Out of respect for each other. We, it's mad, ain't it? All these years ago, we're still pals now. So, 
So if someone's got a weapon, your goal would just be to knock them out as fast oh, as listen, possible. Listen, one thing, if I, again, I'm left hook, right hand, if I can get you with a punch, I'll do my best, but if not, I'm going to end up looking like a tea bag, <laughs> ain't I? So, <laughs> but yeah, I'm very old school, very Lenny McLean style. If I can hit you, you're in trouble, you know. <laughs> so. so how did the police start to get onto your case? What was your first trouble with oh, them? Oh, listen, I'll... With the police as such, it wasn't like, I suppose it was guilt by association. You know, this in the debts, you, you start hanging about with certain people, certain people are known to the police, and you just can't help it. You, you know, I remember we were driving down a motorway once, me and me and my pal Vic and John and my mate Trevor, we just come back from a car boot sale. This is how mad it was. We, and we bought, I remember my mate buying some clothes, like we had woolly hats, stuff like that. Excuse me, we get pulled back coming on, the, I think it was the A12. Three, three um, BMW, silver BMWs come over, barge us off the road. And this was just after all the Harrison. See, that what, what didn't make it any better for me, where the notoriety come from, from the all the Harrison fight, where I got so much press, it really catapulted me up in the world as such, in that kind of, you know, the criminal world, if you want. But I remember we were, so we were driving down the road. Before I could, I'm on the phone. My mate saying to us, it's honest. See, I'm going to hear right, whatever. And he said, it's honest. Before I could pick my phone up, they're running to us, hit the side of the car. They've got us. We were over by the flyover by once did right near the George pub on the 012 going down to um, Kent Sill. And it's, it was raining. And I'm on the phone. And this, this copper come running up. Said, get your hands up. I said, mate, I'm on the phone. He goes, get your hands up. Otherwise, I will shoot. I said, I might put the phone down then, you know what I mean? Then he said, come, come over here. He went, get out of the car. I was, I'll get out of the car. He goes, I'll get on your hands and knees. I said, I'm getting the hands and knees. You're pissing down with rain, mate. And he's going, well, come stand over here then. And I'm going, mate, you look about 12. You've got this kosher neck, a big machine gun. It's bigger than, you know. And before I could do anything, I'm thinking, you know, like you think, oh, what, what's happening now? And I'm thinking, well, should I say this? Should I say that? Before I could say anything, they're going, yeah, that's that Dominic Negus. He just boxed all the Harrison. And I think, oh, I can't really change my name now, can I? You know what I mean? And, so, and then we went to the police station. It was so funny. <laughs> and then the lady at, at the desk, she's booking us in. Uh, they thought we had guns in the car. We didn't have nothing in the car. Oh, I think Trevor, he had he had a nursery then. He had some knives that, you know, it was a legit nursery. He had these uh, to cut the boxes open. And he had them in a the glove box. They pulled us in for these, for these little knives like that. And so I remember, like, I'm standing there, and, it's over, and I, I've got to be honest with you, every time I, if I've ever had a problem with the police, they never give me no egg, you know, and, you know, so, and, I, and I'm really respectful with that, and I've got to so say, no, you treat me all right, and I ain't going to kick off with you. But I was sort of standing there, and it's in, we, the woman go calls my name, and I put my hands on the counter, she's going to, Miss Neg, blah, 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 she goes, oh, look at your hands, they're all bruised, they're all, like, swollen up. And then the cop was so funny. He goes, of course they're swollen up. That's Dominic Negus. He's a boxer. And I was, it was so funny. Then they took me out the back. And they, they do the strip search. And then they do half and half. Take the top half off. You know, and then they take the bottom of my fifth to squat and all this stuff. And I come out the cop and put his arm around me. He goes, oh, look, I've pulled. And they never give me no... And my mate John, they hate him as well. He told him he had a stomach complaint. So every half hour, they're pulling him food in. He was having McDonald's, <laughs> Wimpy. And I'll try to get some sleep. And I'm thinking, oh, bloody hell. And I remember <coughs> I was with this girl then, and I couldn't remember her phone number. I just remembered her address. And I just said, Look, I'm supposed to be having dinner with her. And could you, could someone just let her know I'm not going to make it? Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, I'm, I'm no good with numbers. So I said, I'll give her the address. Anyway, so they eventually all let us out. About, it was about nine o'clock, Ilford, Nick, they let us out. You know, so I've, got, I've come back to McGill there, so they took me back there. Anyway, we see she's having a go at me. And like, she goes, you know, he, you know, why didn't you tell me? My mate said to her, I said, What's happened? He goes, look, Art Mars 2 is supposed to meet. He ain't turned up. And he's gone, and I said, I'm going to beat her. I said, I'll meet the Art Mars 2. And, he's, and my mate Paul went, did he or did he not say? Because I'm going to, I'll meet, I'll, I'll, I'll try. If I said I'm going to try and get there, then I ain't going to make it. So look, I'll meet you there, don't worry. He goes, no, I said he'd be there. And he went straight away, look, he's been nicked. I said, all right. So no, so I get around the house. We had, she ordered some pizzas. And I said, so mad. There was two sisters. I was going out with one sister. My mate Alan was going out with the other one. So we, we like, we got to bed. And also, and I got the Blair Witch project on. And it's so funny. This so I'm in the bedroom and I was going. I'm still stressing out. Thinking, oh, oh what's going on and now? I just want to be left alone. So I just want to be left alone. I ain't done nothing. And anyway, so next week my mate going, Dom. That's what I said. About half left, and he goes, place are downstairs. I'm going, yeah, right, yo, mate. Yeah, you got me here. Because now, Dom, the place are downstairs. Anyway, Jen, the, the, 
my girl's sister said, Dom, no, the police are downstairs. So my nuts gone. I'm going, I can't have this. I'm going, I'm going, what's wrong you going? So I've jumped off the roof. They had a, they had a flat roof outside the bedroom. They went over the kitchen. Jumped off the roof. Jumps over, jumps over the fence. As I jumped over the fence, all I was wearing were these red tracksuit bottoms, these luminous red Adidas tracksuit bottoms. As I jumped over the fence, I've landed in the next door neighbour's uh, fish pond. <laughs> it was so funny. I'm, I'm sitting there just, and I was in good nick then, and I was like that, and I, I had these, these tracksuit bombs and no shoes or no nothing. I've just jumped out, and she's hanging out the window going, Dom, come back, it's all right. She said, what do you mean it's all right? I said, I've had enough of this. She's going, no, they only come and tell me that they nicked you earlier, oh. and that's how quick they were to go and turn. And it was so funny. I was sitting there, oh, you feel this bloody, and I've jumped over the fence, and this girl said, you are so, I'm just so stressed out, you know. That's what I was thinking then. I'm thinking, this ain't the, this ain't the thing for me anymore, <laughs> you know. Especially Blair Witch was on as well. I was, I was crapping myself as it was. <laughs> <laughs> and we, you know, it's quite funny, really, I suppose, you look back. They're, they're, the, they're the funny stories to come out of things, you know, so. But. Well, we're going to go from the funny story to the dark story. Um, it was the thing that made you rethink your occupation was the attempted axe murder. Yeah, yeah. But before we do that, let's set the table for it. And what were the events and circumstances that led up to that incident well listen i'll be honest with you i was just getting i'll be deadly honest with you i was just getting a bit big too i think too big for my boots really you know i'd go about you know no I'll, I'll be honest with you um and it's not no i'll become someone i, I quite despise and i'll become a bit of a bully the fact that not that you know not joe blogs let me imagine going to bar things like that you know wouldn't it wouldn't be with what i call normal people it'd be like people in the <clears throat> like the circle you know, you'd have people there that think they were like all part of this, part of that. And I was very free, free, quick off the mark to show. To, I was just trying to prove a point, really, that I was this tough guy. You know, I wanted a reputation, didn't want to be known as the, the kid that got bullied at school. I mean, it's funny, someone mentioned to Vic once years ago, I remember that Dominic at school, he weren't like that. I said, that's right. And remember, we ain't at school anymore. Because these are the things that made me the person I am today. But then what happened was... <coughs> I become lost from, you know, it gets quite deep here, that I, I, from my true self. I was going out doing these debts. You know, you'd have to go and knock at people's doors that probably didn't need the egg or things like that. And you have to, you become, you become like an actor. You know, you become like, wake up, and then when you put, oh, put this face on, like, growling up at people. And all of a sudden, I really become lost from who I really was. And I look at myself, and I always remember once, my good pal, <coughs> and I was so upset, my mate Bryn rang me one day, we're at the Lloyd, we're talking, there was me, a couple of other pals were sitting there. And he phoned me in the afternoon and said, Dom, I've got to drop you out a little bit. I said, well, now this is my closest friend, you know. And, he, and I don't want to sound like a puff here, but he was, he was like, A, I love him with all my heart, and B, he's the one that always told me the truth. You know, he, to me, he's like the Steve McQueen. Oh, I'll call him Steve McQueen now. He's like the king of cool. But he said, Dom, I can't hang about with you anymore, mate. And I was so heartbroken. He said, because you're coming so unpredictable. You know, and that, and that mate, that's the first time then I started looking at myself. And then it was just, recently a lot of things happened. You know, then I, you know, I could walk into a nightclub and, uh, you know, just push my way in, didn't want to pay, got drinks for nothing. And then people didn't want me in their bars and clubs. And, and then I always remember we got pulled, we got told uh, a nightclub in our area that didn't want us in there. So of course me being me, I'll turn up, I'll pass nine on a Friday night and all everyone's turning up. We got women stood in the, in the back, and um, I remember sitting there and I was saying to them, like the head doorman, you know, I said, Look, I want to know what it's about. Is it you don't want us in here, or does the management don't want us in here? And they've gone, No. He said, Look, you'll be coming, you know, you're coming in here, pushing us about, you know, you'll be you know, becoming a, a pain in people's arse. Like, and I get it. And I just said, Look, I said, Just be honest with me. Is it you or is it the man? Not you personally, but the guys here. He said, Dom, you're coming in here, mate. You're pushing your weight around. We tell you to behave yourself. You end up, like, you know, mugging us off a little bit. And I said, Okay. He goes, What's doing? I said, Okay, I won't come in here no more. I went, Pardon? I said, No. And do you know what? From that day, that's probably one of the last times I ever went in a nightclub. And I, because I'd started realising then, again, I was becoming someone I didn't like. And it was like, from then, you know, and again, with this incident happen, I, I can always remember, you know, who knows what it was about. Could be a million different things, you know. But I just remember coming in there and, and people, you know, see three guys turn up. So hold on a second then. What, just set the scene a bit more. 
What? 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 You want your money's worth? Don't you? You want me, you're getting your money. We, d- we don't like people to cut long stories short on this channel. <laughs> well, I don't mind. We like like to be expanded. Yeah. Take us through the day. What? What year was this? When did it actually happen? Oh, what was it like remember. that day? What was it about? And was where it? where were you going? I was in the gym. It's got to be about 16, 16 and a half years ago. Because you know, Bella, yeah, Bella wasn't born then because Nick was pregnant. Yeah, so I always remember just things were going on. There was loads of different things happening. I know I probably had a row with about. Five people that week, you know what I mean? Where's my money? Give me what well, this was going on, that was going on. So that's why, you know, that's what happens in that world. You you leave people long enough, they get enough rope to hang themselves. So, you know, people are very clever. They can, you know, they you know, if they let sleepers or let things like let lie, then they come back and get you and bite you in the ass. But I remember I was at the gym, I was about oh, when was I, I think it was a Tuesday, I thought it was a Tuesday night. And me and Lenny were there. I was man went into the went into the dressing room just like an old took my clothes off. I remember and the police have still got my bottoms and they've got 135 quid in one pocket. I remember I still want that back actually. But I remember uh, I went in and all of a sudden I turned around and I could hear this damn it yeah, all shouting at school. I turned around and these three fellas standing there. One and they all had these plastic bags on their head, and all of a sudden, as I looked at the first guy, bump, bump, and all bang, 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 the little guys had the gun. And I'm going, what are you gonna do with that? And he's gone in that I've, I've slipped over. What kind um, of a gun? Well, looked like a big one at me. Big one. <laughs> nah, nah, it's just like look like a revolt, like a proper spinner. You know, what I mean, we call them spinners. Yeah, but you know, not an automatic. But it was, you know, them them automatics jam up on you apparently, but then the, the, the spinners don't. So, you know, so because as I looked at the guys with the gun, I've gone over, and I thought, well, I must have slipped over. Because then as I realised, you know, I think, okay, what am I doing on the floor? And it's it's, it's raining, and it's sort of raining. As I've gone, like, as I went to sit up, he's come at me again. He had this like chopper. And he's had to chop my stuck my hand there. As you can see, like it got stuck down my hand. Yeah, and it got like that. It went bang with Ooh, the face. Hold that up to, the, to that camera. Like, like, right down the front. Yeah. Like, you know, but, wow. Um, yeah, it went, that hurt a little bit. But it didn't really, man, things you don't really feel it. Adrenaline. So after, yeah, and all of a sudden he's, then I thought, hold on. You got this reputation, right, man? You pick it up off the floor, you mug, you know what I mean? So I jumped up and also he, he tried to do me again, unless we got stuck in the hand, the blade got stuck in the hand like that. The things you do. You so when he said it was raining, the first yeah, one went a, into your skull. In the back of my head. Back of your so, head. And that's when was, the blood was coming up. And uh, <clears throat> and as that happened, it was like, uh, I think, oh, I'm in trouble here. I think I've upset the wrong people. So <laughs> obviously, obviously they don't come back about my personal training. But anyway, so, just, but, you know, and then, I, and then I've grabbed, I remember grabbing hold of the, the blade and we had a bit of an altercation, me and the big, this big guy. And then I remember the big guy shouting at it, don't just stand there, do something. And that's when the geezer, I can't tell, but I've got a big dent in my arm now. And he, he, he was still got it there now, and he hit me with a bat. So I backed up. I said, we couldn't, and next, as I backed up, I caught the bat. And as I caught the bat, you know, and I've, of course, I didn't realise all my hands had gone. All my hands went like, because all like, everything started, you know, like, got into tendons and stuff. <sighs> but he'd done it again. As I caught the bat the second time, I yanked the bat off of him. And he's fallen on the floor. And, I've, and I always remember that Kalito's way. I don't know if you've seen Kalito's way. Yeah, right? oh yeah, and he's stuck in the toilet without no bullets. And he's going, I'm coming for you. And that's how I was. I'm, I'm going mad. Now I'm smashing this baseball bat everywhere going, come on, come on. I'm expecting the guys to point the gun man and shoot me. And in the end, the guys just squirted me. And they, I'll come out. I said, well, come on then. And next when they squirted me the gas, they squirted me gas and pneumonia. I'm saying, is that it? Come on in. And, 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 and then you could hear the police coming. I've got to hear the old bill car. I said, oh, the boys are coming now. And I went, they all run off, and they went out the, the side door, and I went out the front, which was a big glass plate, and then I could see him getting in this old red car. And then he's looking at me, and I'm just standing there going, I'm still here, you know. <coughs> so if he ha- if he acts you in the head, he obviously trying to kill you. Oh, what, why, I've definitely a wall now. I've definitely upset someone. Why, you know? why didn't the guy shoot you, you think? I don't know. Oh, well, as that's all going, and Melly's going, I remember my trainer, he said he opened the door. He thought he thought it was just me having a row because I was always on the phone shouting and screaming at something. Yeah. That was the job we were in. And I always remember him. He's going, oh, I've come in. I could hear you shouting. I thought, what the fuck? Like, What's going on? And as he opened the door, the guy just pointed a gun at him. And I always remember he held the door locked. He held the door shut. Listen, I'm you know, not bringing up, I'm just telling you what happened. He held the door shut so he couldn't get because obviously, you know, his arse dropped out a little bit. He said, Geezer point. Not everybody can react differently. When you get a point, gun pointed at there's two things you're going to do. You're going to go and you're going to run away. He tried to run away, but held the door locked. So, of course, now they can't get out because I'm fighting back. Because if you just opened the door, I'm hoping they would have run out because I'm going back at them now. But no, because he's held the door locked, so they've got to come at me more. So, what do you oh. say about the boy and cock and thing goes, you point a gun, you run, or you got them, or you point, then I'm running away. So, but they've come at me because they can't get out that way now. They can only get out the other way. So, with that, the guys, 
Then he's let the door go. The geezer's run after him, point a gun at him. So me personally, I don't think the geezer's going to shoot anybody because I don't care how, how good a shot you are. You're going to get 10 foot away. You've still got half a chance of getting someone. So he's run after him, going, oh, you get uh, shouting and screaming. So then they've all run out. And I'm sitting there and I always remember because I've got the baseball bat in one hand and my, I didn't, it was so, you know, you don't realise what you're doing because it's happened so quick. Of course, my trainers come running back in. He's going, oh, Dom, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said, what do you mean? <coughs> you're sorry, I'm sorry. Look at the mess. Of course, there's claret everywhere. Did you think you were going to bleed <coughs> out? Well, no, but the man rings. The geezer walks in the side door with a black coat on, like leather, big lump. Because I've gone, I right, ooed a beep of you. And he's one CID, mate, with front because the Howard Hill police station is just across the road. So, of course, I've gone, uh, He's gone, what's going on here, mate? I said, oh, uh, burglars, mate. Burg I've gone, Lenny. <laughs> burglars. He goes, what do you mean burglars? I said, well, the crackheads, you don't do anything for any, you know, they, they're going to nick anything. <clears throat> but I'm sitting, of course, the ambulance turns up. And he goes, we want you to lay down. I said, I ain't laying down, mate. Don't, I'll get on the back. You know, you got laid down on the, the, well, the gurney thing, is it? And then he's going, <clears throat> look, we've had three guys to try to put him down. He get in, as soon as they shut that van, like the ambulance on the back, I just went, <laughs> fell over, I did. They pulled this saline stuff in. He go, you've lost such blood. I mean, they, you know. But again, you know, we're going to go into things, you know, who knows what it's about? You know, people, do you know what it's about? I don't care anymore because it just proved, you know, that weren't the life for me. And I've always said it, we said it earlier, I deserved it. I did, not for what people were there. People say, no, it was the baddest, bad that. But you can't live the life I was living without expecting to get a kick up the nuts once in a while. And all it did was prove to me, hey, certain people had around me, I mean, I, you know, we think they're all your pals. Turn, you know, I was lucky, you know, again, this loyalty thing I've just spoke about earlier has paid off. You know, the people I'd around me then are still the people I've around me today, you know, and they, they were the people that stu stood by me. You know, again, I didn't want no one else getting involved because I didn't know what it was about. Could have come to like five or six different places. But again, you, you know, for what I was doing, again, in nightclubs, pushing my weight around, you know, I was I'd become quite was it belligerent to people, and again I'll become a bully, and so bullies get what they deserve, don't they? And I've got what I deserved, and that's why I try and be, you know, I have this thing now where I try and talk to people. Where I walk down the road, hello mate, you know, just try and be polite because it's taken me fifty years now to realise, yeah, I can look after myself, but. There's always someone out there. I wouldn't say definitely not bigger or better, but they're a bit more spiteful, a bit more cunning than I am. Because I ain't like that. You know, if I, you've upset me, put the kettle on, mate. I'm coming through your door. You know, make sure. And I like, I like chocolate biscuits or custard creams. But if you've upset, I'm coming. But you ain't like that now. The only time you're ever going to see that person again is you go near my daughter. I don't care. Let, I will. I will call every favour in, and I'll name some proper favours of a proper people. Then that's the only time I'll ever call it in. Anybody goes hurts my girl, other than that, you ain't gonna. See, I don't need to be that person. I just, I just a you know a big. When my daughter calls me, I don't mind it. A big bear. I don't mind me calling a big bear. You don't call me a fat bastard. You know what I mean? But you know, it's and you've actually credited your assailants with being the angels who got you out of the gangster lifestyle. Yeah, million percent. You know. If I could sit down and have a beer with them, I would. I've got no honest. It, the life I was in then, it, I was a commodity bought and sold. Then what's happening is I left the game. Someone else took my spot. And it, in fact, when I come out of that position, my good friend took over from where I was. And the, the poor, I'm not going to go into details, but he ended up getting a chunk of bird. And I did say to him, I said, I knew it was because it was either going to be you or me. And it was like, <laughs> I'm gifted that, you know, these three people come along and made me realise. That ain't the world for me. I didn't want to go to prison. I realised that before. And the prison ain't prison ain't for me. Yeah, you know. And it, again, it, again, what I said earlier: if anybody touched my girl, yeah, you you put me away for life because I'm 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 coming. You know. And other than that, all all this criminal world ain't for me. Ain't for me. It's, I've I've learnt the hard way. You know, I used to be a car spy by trade when I first left school. Sometimes I wish I should have stuck to that because I love painting cars. But again, if I didn't do the things I've done, I wouldn't be the position I'm today. You know, I would have never met Nick, who, you know, she's a great mum. Uh, I wouldn't have had Bella. See, Bella is the one, except them three fellas, and Bella come along, she made me realise that, nah, nah, at least keep away. As long as no one comes near me, I've got no reason to be, be that person I was. Otherwise, uh, all right, so we left off. You were in the ambulance, door shut, you conked out. <laughs> yeah. What happens next? I remember going I remember going to the, the hospital, and before I got there, arm response is there already. We must have had 20, 30 people turn up. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? 
And I remember, <coughs> I remember sitting in that bed all night. And you got one bloke over there coughing his nuts. Like, you got this geezer shouting and screaming in his sleep. And I think, oh. mm. and I'm thinking they're gonna come back. They've got to finish the job. Mm. And I'm looking around. There's nothing around me. I've couldn't. There's nothing I can have. And I did not sleep a wink. But I remember. Did you call any mates over to protect you? No, nah, but they were already there. They. <laughs> one of the worst things I can honestly say I've seen and it, like in it, the Godfather or in the hospital honestly there must have been 30 people turn up it, it got I remember my pal went to pick Nick up she was at home and I said look there's something's happened at, at the gym can you come yeah so she she ain't silly my girl oh my god well she wasn't silly back then but story, that's a complete that's another book on that one but um, anyway so she comes to the hospital I've got my mate John Johnny Farsands is there we got my mate B's turned up and, he, and he's, he's upset and he's sitting there. And we had a, uh, the nurse, she's checking me and she's going, this this cut there was, I know you said, oh, I see your bones and that. But she had, we had an x-ray. So she stuck her finger so fine that old to go like that, to check for to metal things because you had to go in the x-ray. But the worst one, because I got stabbed, I got like, cut here and cut there and I got stabbed. I got stabbed in the legs a few times. And I said, I got a dent in where done the bat. And of course, I got the fractured skull. Um, but the main thing was they sat there and they and okay, Nick was there and they were watching me get stitched up and it was horrible. I'm holding onto this chair and I'm holding onto it and I broke the chair because I'm because we're just stitching my head up and then stitch that was that was horrible. That was it looked like I think you know something you do it like knitting class. You stitch it and I was just sitting there thinking, oh, you know, I'm thinking mm, I've upset some people now, ain't I? <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think, oh, I need to go another day. I think. <laughs> but I remember we I remember they, so we, the police come the next day. There. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that. It was a, it wasn't a regional crime. It was national crime squad, and they just said they seemed to have more of a fix on it than I did. And then I remember we were just sitting there, and, and, the, and they said, "Look, we've heard this, we've heard that." I said, "Listen, it's just burglars, mate. It's burglars, you know." And this cop was going, "Well, you know, we've got our own thing. You know, we've got our own intel. You know, you seem to be upsetting a lot of people lately." I said, "Well, whatever." And I remember the cop was really good to me. He goes, can I just say something off the record? Just be careful what you say on the phones. You know what I mean? He said, because anything, everything happens, he said, I don't care if it's nothing to do with you, but anything happens in this area, we're going to nick you. And I said, listen, mate, I'm a nice guy. He, got, and it, he was really nice, actually. He reminded me a bit like uh, Columbo. I was just waiting for him to go, turn up and go, hey, can I just ask you a question? I'm going, well, I'm fucking, ain't I? Know you. you know what I mean? Because I see it. But now he just goes, uh, he just said, I've sat here for 20 minutes. And he goes, I think you're a smashing fella. He goes, I don't know what's going on. He said, look, just behave yourself. And that's, again, it was just a complete, complete turning kind of thing for me. And I don't mean it like, you know, because I, I, you know, my son had a great, great life. But I've been, all, been around the world, done some bits of, you know, people people who that kind of live that life. If you're Joe Bloggs and you mention things to him, they go, they're not even interested in that life. Oh, never. The amount of people I know that go, I've never even had a fight in my life. You know, I remember one week, I, I think I knocked out 18 people in one go. And that ain't you know, a bit of work, a bit of this, I'm going to the pub, I had the ump, you know, I've had a rare with the old woman going to the pub, take out. He said, what are you looking at, mate? Crack, bang. You know what I mean? And that's what I'm saying. You can't live that life and not expect to get pulled up. And I um, said so before, I'm forever grateful for certain things because by rights I should be in prison or I should be dead, shouldn't I? And that's how it is. You know, we're opening, you never know, we're coming on your show, we could get a film out of this, but we need a happy ending. You know, we <laughs> want to know the happy ending. Because since then, I mean, it's like, I kept out of the way. I mean, I don't know what other questions are going to lead on from here because it's like, I don't want to say too much because it's going to probably follow on to something else. But I mean, it was, it was, you know, you heed the angel's warning. You know, I mean, I had three things come at once and I had to listen because it was, you know, it was only going to go one way, weren't it? So... When I was running around in the club scene, thinking I was the man, Mr. Cool Guy, and then, you know, we all get arrested, I'm deported, so I'm no longer around my mates, and there wasn't that, like, enticement for me yeah. to get back in it, but this happened to you, and you were still in that area. Yeah. It was odd. <coughs> Aren't your mates, like, saying things like, come on, yeah, yeah, listen. You want, didn't you want to get back into the mix? Listen, even now, I've, 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 because as I've got older, I'm still, part of me is my my guilt by association. I still know all, a lot of my friends are still A players, if you know what I mean. They're still doing whatever they're doing. Nothing to do with me. I don't really spend a lot of time. And I, again, <clears throat> where I work now, I spend you know, the time I have. That's why, I, again, that's why I bring my daughter with us today because I want to spend as much time as I can with her. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, people always go, oh, Dominic, yeah, where we're saying. What annoys me is, right, 
I went through a bad spell about 18 months ago. I was just talking about this in the car here. And it's how, how your friends treat you. You know, it's like I've done a lot of things for a lot of people. And I remember I had this bad spot about 18 months ago. And my mate rang me, and he, I've helped him out with a few things. And I said, oh, I'm so glad you called. Do me a favour, mate. Because goes, Dom, I'll ring you back in half hour, mate. I've just got to sort this out. Do you know what? Still, I'm still waiting for that phone call. And about all the things you do for other people. And it's like, <clears throat> I've either, you know, not, listen, I never had nothing. I wasn't Charlie Big Bananas with the big flash cars and had loads of money. But I, I just did what I wanted. I could go away, do this, do that. You know, but now I realise the value of actually going to work for my money. You know, and it's, it's a nice feeling to do a week's work. Money's in the bank, pay my tax. I've got nothing. <laughs> you know, tax bank wants to go, I've got nothing you can have anyway. I've got nothing. I never had nothing. I was too busy, you know, I said before, I was too busy trying to get this reputation. But as you said, yeah, there's, there's still people like back in the day, oh, don't come with a bit of work. I remember we now, we went out for dinner, me and me and Nick, with a my pal that I was working with back then, and, he, he, and I stepped out of the frame. And I give Nick her joke, she would speak her mind. And he's going, oh, no, we need Don back in with us. Like, he was such a good money getter. Not money getter, but he was like, he, he was so staunch. He'd never leave you. And my, my woman said, yeah, that's nice. Like last time, fractured skull, 70 stitches. Where was everybody then? You know, and it, it, it is funny. Like, I'll give her a joke. She she never held back like that. Again, it was just, I realised, it made me realise who my friends were. You know what I mean? And then, oh, I did have to, you know, I stepped out of it. And I always remember we went to Tenerife. <laughs> And the people were asking questions. They were throwing my pal up, my good pal, and they're going, well, you've heard from him. What's, he's all right. He goes, yeah, he's all right. Leave him alone. Like, leave him alone. He's, he's uh, you know, I mean, he ain't said nothing. You know, he's wiped his mouth. He just wants to be left alone. And, it, and we come back from, we come back from Tenerife, and I remember there was one message on the phone. I can't remember what it was, but someone's saying, I just want you to know I'm your friend. I had nothing to do with it and all this stuff. And I had three phones like you do, and I just threw them all away. And in about two weeks later, I went back, <clears throat> went back to work, working for my friend, who's, who's done really well with himself. He's in the construction, and I was doing second clean cleaning on these new flats he bought. And I remember always phoning him, going every nearly every other day, thanks. You know what? Thanks a lot for it. It wasn't good money. I mean, it was good money. Two weeks one, but I was earning good money, like but straight money if you want. You know, that's about eighty quid a day. Then this is what Bella be. I think because Nick was pregnant with Bella, and it was like you know. It was it was nice just to go to work, come home, eat my dinner. You know, this was what normal people do, isn't it? And it's and it was really nice. And it was really nice. How long did it take to recover from your injuries? <clears throat> it wasn't so much. It wasn't never so much the, the physical side. I'm, I'm I suppose I've got skin like a tortoise. You know what I mean? Like I've got a face made for right. I'm great with this, like the radio. As long as I ain't got a camera, but <clears throat> it's more the mental side of things. You know, it does it does shock you, you know, because I, I still have flashbacks now a little bit, like. Three geezers coming in there, yeah, you know. All good. I remember once we were, we were at an old, um, we had our Bella, and Nick was pregnant with Bella. We were at this old place in Chinkford. I was sitting on the couch. Bella was in bed. Uh, Nick was in bed, and a really bad thunderstorm. And I was half asleep on the sofa, and we had like a stair stairway come up the stairs, and all of a sudden you had the you had the kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, front room. And all of a sudden, this thunderstorm was so like, scared the life out of me. And all of a sudden, as I looked around, and it was like these three fellas all in black were coming towards me. Mm. And I, I really, and the first time in my life, I froze. And I got my hands and knees, and I had to crawl to get in the bed. It's really, I've never had it before. I've done whatever ever since. And I had to crawl to get in the bed. It was like I froze. And I got to bed, and I was holding really tight. She was pretty, she goes, what's the matter? What's the matter? I said, nothing, nothing, nothing. And it's just really weird. And it's, again, I suppose that's... You know, the comeuppance, I think, and that life, ain't it? It's like, you know, I still get the ump now. I get the ump. I get, oh, everyone gets the ump, don't they? It's like someone says, oh, your chin neck, geez, oh, I get some old fucking nerves. Or, and all of a sudden, I sit there some morning, I look, and I look at myself, and I'll go, yeah, but let's leave that. Let's leave this, because I really find now, I love the word karma. Karma's such a good word, because <laughs> there's lots of people out there had me over. Not like that, but for silly things. You look back, and I look back now, my life's going now. They're going touch wood. It ain't supersonic, but it's better than it has been for years. And it's all for me now. I've got, I said, I've gone to work. I'm working hard. You know, it's about me and Bella. Me and Bella. It's about, you know, like, let's go on holiday. I said, a better day. Where do you want to go on holiday next year? Let, let, if on this corona thing, you know, I'm probably be in the back garden. But, you know, <laughs> but let's do something just because I know my time with her is running out. Not, again, not like that because she's getting older now. 
And I'm never going to hold her back. She's gonna, she can do whatever she wants. But let's like when we got this to be, so let's enjoy it together. I'm trying to get her to go on a cruise, but she won't have it. She don't want to go on a boat. I don't know what's up. Come on, <laughs> you know what I mean? Fancy the cruise life. But uh, yeah, but it's, I don't know. It's just uh, life's just really funny, ain't it? Uh, one minute you you take, you know, we all. I think listen, one minute we're all going to end up in the box, ain't we? That's when we know that. Well, I just want to try and enjoy myself. I'm 50 now. I never thought I'd make it this far. You know, I remember when I'd be 30 if. You know, before Bella came along, and I was like, bloody, I made it 30. Then I made it to 40, made it 50. It's like, so I'm hoping the, bit, the big man upstairs has got better things for us, you know. So, so you, what you described there is like PTSD then from the attack. Uh, as the nightmares and the flashbacks, has that gone down nah, over the years? Well, I still get them. I still get them. I went to the doctors <coughs> with a bit of a tatar tie, I should say, in a, in a local uh, bar. We went over there. Dorman got a bit cheeky. So they got ironed out, you know, and they see it, bang, bang, bang. There's, there was a few of us there. But I remember I, I had to go to my doctor. I never slept for three weeks. Lost a load of, I wouldn't mind losing a lot of weight now. Perhaps I'll keep awake for three weeks. But I had to go to the doctor and he said, you, you're you suffering from that P, what they call PTSD. it, post domestic yeah. syndrome. And my doctor's known me since I was a baby. Like he, he was really good. I've got like, you know, I go see my doctor on a Monday. And I walk in into his surgery. And he was so good. I'm going to say because I'll probably get in trouble. But I walked in, it was surgery, and they used to hate me. I walked in, it's Dr. So and so, and now he's busy. I need to go, could you could you tell him Dominic's here? And they hated it because they can't turn. And he go, he go, just sit there. Two minutes later, he goes, Dominic, can you come in? What you done now? Who you it now? Who you? And he, a couple of times he helped me out, like bandaged me up a little bit. But I went to him for this thing, and I remember we'd went out. It was a Christmas do. And the first time ever, I'd come back about three o'clock in the morning. No, I'd never done that with my woman. And she thought straight away I'd been off with another woman. Took me to the Monday to tell her I've had a fight in the nightclub, knocked out four doormen. And then next, she's going, and she was so cool, though, right? She goes, I said, Nick, I need to tell you something. She goes, what? I said, I knew it. I knew it. You, you slept with someone else. I said, no, Nick. I said, look, I've had a bit of a fight. She goes, what do you mean you've had a fight? I said, she goes, what do you mean? She goes, how many? I said, four. She goes, what? I said, I mean, it was more than just me there. I mean, but it was, I'd got older of four people, and then it, it was about eight, it was, you know, there's a few other bodies knocked out, not just me. She goes, what do you mean now? I said, there was, there was a doorman. She goes, well, don't worry about it then. I said, what do you mean, don't worry about it? Because, well, I thought, she goes, no, you know, you're, you're going to be like, but that Christmas, the worst Christmas side, we went around my friend's house for dinner. All I kept thinking, they're going to nick me, they're going to nick me, they're going to nick me. Turns out my pal comes back from Malta. And uh, he goes, oh, Dom, I meant to tell you. He goes, oh, the old doorman, because he knew him all. The old doorman phoned us up. He said, uh, oh, can you tell the big fella we don't want no more trouble? Can you, like, tell him it's all right? And there's me for about four weeks crapping myself. You know? So I've had to go and see the, the, my doctor and give me these sleeping pills. And that's what he said, look, Dom, you need to get some help here because you're, you're struggling. I'm telling about these things going on. And <clears throat> I'm saying to him, mate, oh, I'm going to get nicked. He goes, Dom, you ain't. Stop it. Calm down. And it ruined me from couple of months and that's and that's all because of that i mean i don't i don't know anybody that you're telling me that doesn't struggle with things like that you know the, the things we were getting up to like like the fighting and stuff like that it wasn't like it was it was just and in hand it was every day someone's getting the right hand or someone's getting a tug for this someone's getting a tug for that and it was just that and i said before like coming away from that he's still he's still still here now he's still you know i worry about i mean i worry about stupid things now where before i didn't care uh, but since Bella's come along, I worry about everything like, oh, I've got to pay this, got to pay that. I have a missed call that I don't know. That I don't like uh, withheld numbers. But I've got my head around it now a little bit. Nine times out of them cold quarters now, aren't they? But you ain't going to get nothing out of me. So. But. so the incident with the four people that you knocked out <laughs> then, what, what brought that about? Oh, we just, we got, oh, they wouldn't let us in the, they wouldn't let us into the bar. So be honest, it was our fault. Look, we're not we with a few people. It was a Christmas do. We went to go in the bar. We thought it was about half past ten. It wasn't. It's was like twelve o'clock. It turns out we had five minutes of drinking up time, and we we thought they were just being funny. And the doorman, they were a bit they were a bit flesh anyway. We they had a bit of a bad reputation there anyway because we took liberties with a lot of people there. And of course, we turned up. I went to walk away, and I went off. Went, my mate, God, Dom, it's kicking off. It's kicking. So I walked back. Now the guys will come down for this other club. Be some cage fighting guys out of here, here like that, and his front nose like that. And he had this Burberry jacket, and he took his jacket off. and said, "Well, you'll earn your money now." So he got it first, and then the guys on the door then realise it's happening now because he went over like like went bang, he left hook to him. He's gone over. My old manager, my old manager was in the bar, and he goes, "I see scuffling." Goes because they were laughing at us because we weren't getting in, and then when they realised how serious it was, because the geezer, the mouthy one at the door, 
he wasn't English. I don't know what he was, but he was going, no, no. He goes, you're on telly, you're on, you're on telly. No, no fight, no fight. I said, I'm always on telly, mate. And my mate just said, all right, so you go like, he comes shoot. He goes, I see this geezer come shooting through the door and he's gone bang on the floor. And that was it. We just walked in and it was just, it was madness. And my mate, this was after the first book come out. And my mate said to me, I goes, mm, now I can see what I've written a book about, yeah. <laughs> but it's again, you know, I was just being, I think I was just a little bit silly there. And perhaps should have just walked away and got the cab on going, shouldn't I? Yeah. But again, something like that, the backlash of that ruined me for, you know, they're right. They probably got knocked out, woke up, think, oh, I've done my bet. Nick, go to work the next day. And there's me thinking, oh, could I get nicked and all this stuff again. So, but. So mental health is, is an important <laughs> part of the story. And Very. Ricky Hatton. He did the forward for your book. And do you want to just tell us a bit about your struggle with mental health? Yeah, well, this is not, again, I struggle with lots of things. You know, I'd, uh, you know, there's, it's hard for me sometimes because we're, well, obviously my daughter's sitting here. There's, there's things I'll, no, oh, listen, she's going to find out anyway. But I, I've struggled with, like, like, depression. I mean, the first, the first Christmas I had, when I split up from uh, Bella's mum, I remember I went, end up, I remember going around her mum's house and they were sitting there and I was like, oh, happy, happy Christmas. You know, sorry, Christmas. Uh, so we're sitting there and I'm going, oh, I'm just waiting for her to go, oh, why don't you stay for dinner? And uh, I said, so, you know, like, I'm going now. Okay, you want in? Bye then. What? Yeah, I'm going now. And I said, like, Bella's happy. I mean, she's still a kid, you know what I mean? So she, you know, I just want her to be happy. But I remember we went my mate's house for dinner and then I just remember going back because I was lived at the gym when I first split up with, with, with Nick. I ended up staying in the gym for a year and a half, sleeping on the floor. Just because I was paying for everything, you know, I was only I was training the boys then, so I, we had, went to the gym. Gym's flying, but I remember sitting there, and I remember I didn't remember my friend's house, and uh, I remember just going back to uh, just going back to the gym, and I remember on the way I got a bottle of Jack Daniels, and I remember sitting there, I was having this Jack Daniels, and I'm sitting there, and as I'm drinking this Jack Daniels, I'm looking at it, I've got a big pipe run through, and I'm embarrassed, to, I'm embarrassed to say this because my daughter's sitting there, but uh, I'm thinking. Mm. And if they can take my weight, and I don't abide by the grace of God, mm. by the grace of God, I don't know. My friend lent me this DVD, and it was Ray Donovan. And all of a sudden, as I looked at him, Ray Donovan's on. I'm going, oh, I ain't seen this one, and it took my mind right off of it. And it's, you know, the things that you know when you hear about things like you, the Tyson Fury thing, when you're saying, well, he, he was driving his car and it smashed it. Go, one things ain't going well. This, I think, we're fighters. We got to fight this thing. But it's just so hard. I mean, I'll get, I'll get really pulled in. I remember <coughs> going 18 months ago when the book came out. I should have been flying. You know, I just had a bit of personal stuff was going on. And, you know, and I was training the boys in the gym. We had we had, we had a really good stable of fighters. We had Boy Jones Jr., Sanji Sahota, Amza um, Shiraz. Now, that's a good kid. You know, he's flying now. Um we had about four foot Liam Liam Dillon. He was just tagging along. Stevie Stevie and Bobby Kibbs. They're doing a great job of him. He's Southern Area Champion now. Uh, but anyway, so things were going on then. But so when a book came out, I mean, we had a book book launch. So my pals Adam Books. He's got a pub called the Free Cults, and that's a really top top pub. We had there. And just had some bad news, and they come down and interview and talk about get you. If you ever watch it, it's on YouTube, and it's it just really air funny from my eight months ago. Our Dan, I was there. So I am now. Things you just got to keep, just got to keep ploughing forward, which is, which is hard. But I remember I did an interview and I just caught me. I was writing in such a bad, bad way, and it was all the sudden. Again, that's why I'm forever grateful for my, for my mate Butch uh, that got me back working, and Eric and Jay, Grand Off Designs, little plug there. But now they just went back working and, and kept me working every day, every day. You know, I was so upset about. It. I'm not going to go into things, but just so upset about something that was that had come up. What well, I found out. And I, and I thought, you know what, I've just had enough, just had enough. But every day, I was getting stronger, every day. But what hurts me so much more, we had the book come out, and I should be flying. We had so much, and that's why I feel so bad with Jamie. <laughs> we had so many things lined up. But because I got the arm, I went, no, nah, bollocks, don't want to do nothing. You know, I ain't speaking to you. I've got other things going on. And that, um, what's his name? English. Uh, sorry. Be... James English. James English was ringing me. And he was quite... <laughs> He was quite good. I said, look, James, this is happening. I wrote, he goes, no, calm down. You know, we, we'll have a splot with you whenever you want. Again, I was sitting there this day, and I, I just had this really bit of bad news. And this Kevin Mitchell rang me, and I said, the one I've boxed three times. And out of the blue, I don't know why, he said, Dom, I, I had this feeling I needed to talk to you. And I went, K 
Kev, oh my God, like we tried to kill each other three times in the ring, you know, and this geezer come out of the blue and all of a sudden, certain people don't realise how lucky I feel to have them in my life. I mean, you'd always got to hear, hear me talk about Emery and Bryn. They, they, they're, without them two in my lives, I would be dead. I know that. They stood by me and the loyalty thing come through. But they're the ones that took time to talk to me, have a bit, you know, because people are getting fed up with me, you know what I mean? There's Dom, oh, he's on a down. I don't keep, God, oh, that's why I can't be around negative people. And there it was all the sunnies, again, day by day, like this going, this Kevin, Kevin ring me. I remember having this mad conversation with my pal Joe Long and Paul Aldo. They phoned me up and it was just little by little, I got better. I'm not, listen, I said, I said in this uh, interview I did, and it hurts me. It's like when, my, when I drop my daughter off, it's really weird. It's like I've got this empty, there's a like hole inside of me and it's empty. And, and I'm, it's so hard because it's, I, it, it, it ain't good, you know. And it, so every day I've got to, I've got to power on. I've got to keep going. Do you know what I mean? And it's like people look at me. I look at him. He's he's tough. He's I ain't like that. People don't really know what I'm like because people, certain people haven't. They never had the time to sit there and actually talk to me, except for the likes of like my mate Bryn and Emery. These these people, they, they don't have to do nothing for me. But our loyalty, they, you know, I'm, our loyalty's paid my bills, and it, and it is hard. It is. I just want, I just want an, I just want a happy life, you know. I mean, I want, I want this, I want this feeling to go, you know, because it, it sort of, is, you know, I can't put no more pressure on my daughter because she's there anyway. She don't need to know what I'm going. I don't want to think in life's like this because I've made this life happen. I put myself. No one made me do the things I did. You know what I mean? And, it, and it's hard. It's hard because it's like, you know, we have, me and her together. I mean, it's like we have such a good time. She makes me laugh. You know, she makes everything all right. She made me a better person. You know, soon this little this little girl pop out and she's a bundle of joy, and then realise all this crap I've been involved with. That's nothing. You know what I mean? I probably would have been better carrying on doing the car spraying or carrying on doing the boxing but then you go it's like well I got involved with all the other stuff it just ruined it all but that was my fault and I've got no one else to blame except for me so now all I want to do is make a good life for her you know what I'm saying I mean I don't know if you've got kids on it but she and I keep saying it don't know if I mentioned I've got a daughter but yeah, she she made everything all right she made me realise where I'd gone wrong and it's 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 not bad how, how hard it's just this is the program to say how hard I am Nah, this ain't about that. Listen, there's probably ten people worse off me out there. Just with me, I just, I just had a bad temper, and but with me, when my temper went, it was free going. It was free going, and everybody got a bit of it, you know. And it, it's, it, you know, life's different now. Life's so different now. So and, it, and better, better. And I don't mind going to work. I love going to work. It makes me very humble, you know. You've gone from ego and violence to family values and love, and there's nothing more important than that. That's oh a really good message. Well, all I want, all I want to be is feel, I look after my mate's house, right, three nights a week. He's my best mate, my mate B, and I feel privileged to be there. And I, look, and I go, I look at my mate's hostel. I mean, but all I want to do is be part of something. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like my mum and dad are gone. If my mum was alive now, I'd probably be living with her in Italy because that's what you do, you split me, I'd go, that's how it is, and we could have a great life out there. But then it's like, no, I'm not here. I'm here. I've got to be with me. I mean, we were, when I was training the lads, it's like we were out in Spain <laughs> for two or three years, on and off, we were out in Spain training out there. We were lucky to set up we had. <laughs> training at Ricky Atten's gym a week of a month. Training at Mir Khan's gym a week of a month. Two weeks, three weeks, we were over in Spain. Kiko Martinez, best training there. Everything's all set out. That was my life for years. Just certain things happened. People listened to the wrong people. And then I went down the wrong road. One thing always, always, always upsets me a little bit, and I let's let's get it out of the table. Well, I put my, I put everything on the line for the fighters I was training. Got in debt, which went. I was always about the bigger picture. We were we were flying. Then also, I'm the shit at the fan, and I went. Do you know what? Don't want nothing to do with this no more. Then I got a, a little vibe come back that someone's told me that I was taking half of my fighters' money. One of these fighters, you, I was taking half their money. It's funny that I was with my accountant the other week and we were talking, we were laughing and joking about because this, this little firm was sponsoring this fella. He goes, Well, it's funny that now, if you were taking half of his money, he still owns you a hell of a lot of money because because I had to pay my tax. And he's going, Well, you know, he owns me a few grand. I said, Because it's all rubbish. It's all rubbish. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. When I walked away from him, boys, I'm, I'm the one that I can look at myself in the mirror and wash my teeth in the morning. I think, Do you know what? You were all right. You did it your way. They did it their way. 
don't really hear from them now. Well, good luck to them. I really hope they do well, and I've never had no malice towards them like that. But a lot of people, what they lack in life is integrity. Do you know what to say? Do you know what? I was wrong. I was wrong. I mean, I admit, I've, 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 I think I've admitted a lot that I've, I was wrong with certain things. But then it's like, you know, with the, I love the boxing, but that side of the sport is really doggy, and it ain't for me because I'm too stand up. You know, I could look in them and there ain't a lot of bad decisions I've made. Certain things, certain fights some of the boys took I didn't want and they took the fights because I wanted them. I said, and they didn't, it didn't come off them, did it? And as, I, as I know, it didn't work. So what I'm always saying is I always had them boys' backs from day one. I always did whatever I could. I went out and nearly sold my soul to cover them boys. But then, it, it, you know, and all I ever wanted was loyalty and I never got it back. So I'd rather do what I'm doing now. So... We live a better life, and that's how it is. So there's some big names then in your story that you've brought up: Roy Shaw, Lenny McLean, Vic Dark. Have you got any funny or interesting stories about them that you can share? I don't know. Was, the stories of Vic, I'm not saying. <laughs> I mean, I've been out. I was. I've been out with Roy loads of times, but not really. You know, I just. I don't know. Just every time we'd go, we'd we'll always have a laugh. It was always. I remember once I was out with Vic, and well, I wasn't out with Vic. I was out on my own and. A couple of people played up and end up doing what I do best and end up, you know, chinning someone. And then remember Vic come over and he went, look, Dom, come on, mate, this is silly. You know, we, you know, we know the fella, blah, blah, blah. And I went, oh, okay, mate, okay. Next week, come out the toilet. And he's going, look, come on, Dom, sort it out. I said, oh, I'm really sorry about it. And he goes, right, well, next week, goes, well, oh, I won't be funny, mate. Well, I've got the ump with you. I said, what's we got the ump? And Vic said, oh, and he ended up knocking him out again. And Vic went, oh, do you know what, Dom? I'm leaving you, mate. You're on your own. And I'll, go, I'll become a bit uh, very unpredictable. And the mad thing is, though, I've seen some of the people I've had problems in in the past, and I've sat there and I've, and I've had to sit there and shake their hands. I said, you know what? I wasn't in a good place back then. And it, but I was very, I was a very good money getter for people. You know what I'm saying? It's like when I was upset with things, you could, I'd be straight in. We'd be straight in, and you wouldn't have to worry about me. I'm gonna, I'll go and do what I've got to do. And I, you know, and I wasn't really worried about the money because I again, I just wanted to feel wanted. Do you know what I'm saying? I wanted to be part of this clique that wasn't really there. You know, and, it's, and the only the only thing I worry about again now is my, like, I'm very, I can, I know you know you say about you count your friends, but I can't. I've got I've got my friends on one end, and obviously I've got Bella, and that's that's all that matters now. You know what I'm saying? So, have you got any funny stories from your time in Tenerife, pa partying over there, or anything? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what's really sad? And we, uh, I said this the other day. We sit and we tell all these stories. These war, anyway, because what well, you're what you what you're fishing for, Sean, is a war story, aren't you? Really? <laughs> well, anything. It could be a humorous story, <laughs> but it's always interesting. For someone's getting that <laughs> town. I remember I was, I was over with a pal of ours, and we were we were in bobbies. You know, what I mean, there's bobbies, and there was a you know every every day someone's getting bashed. Or we we were there. My mate used to be a rep over there. So we're going to have this three of us gone there. I mean, those people know everybody out there back in the day. So all of a sudden, my mate's sitting there, and a load of girls come up, started talking to us, but mostly my pal, because he knew them all from the rep days. And there's about four geezers coming, and they don't realise this fella's with me, and he's a good-looking guy, my mate Lee, bodybuilder. You know, they got the ump with him. They, oh, my God, they're screwing. And my mate Wolfie's there. And there's me, Wolfie, and uh, I remember one of... Jamie McLean's pals were there, Lenny's sons, Alan, his name was good, another good looking guy. And uh, we're sitting, we're all nice, and we ain't seen our faces, we're sitting there. You know, I couldn't, but now one across here, and then these geezers, they're talking about my pal. Oh, they got the ump, because he, he's not just talking to him. And they're going, right, you could see him going to the toilet and exit the game. You could see they're lining him up, and they're going, they're going to have a go at him. Next minute, before he could do it, my mate said to me, he goes, he goes, I thought when you walked up, there was one big lump, one little, and then one small geezer was there, geezer behind him. He goes, I thought you missed him. I wasn't going to, I was going, I was going to the bigger. And as he what, I hit the first geezer, bang, I hit, he's gone. And as a as a little bloke's come, he's sort of like scurried away. He's he's done the bottle, he's come at me with a bottle. And if I don't know, bought you there, but look, you see, he got stuck, the bottle got stuck in the end. But as I've, I've, I've left up to him as well. But then I could see this bottle coming next to me. Some geezer's like trying to do me the bowl. So I've turned around and gone, crack, crack. As I, of course, it's nice. me mate Wolfie. I've knocked him out. So I'm trying to put Wolfie up by the by the, by the back of his 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 shirt. And he's popped this out. Well, he's got stuck in as well. Give me a second. Well, 
But anyway, my mate's come out of the toilet and he goes, within two minutes, he, if he could, if he was here too, he goes, there's me running around like a loony. I'm going mad still. He got the DJ packing his music up, the lights on, there's three or four people laying on the floor unconscious, and there's me got the young going, Aah! you know, on my poor old wolf, you know, he had an hole in his mouth. And he used to do it all other day. He got his toothpick. He's putting his mouth like that. He'd go like that. His toothpick would come in and out. <laughs> but he's, yeah, but it, it was quite funny. <sighs> but what he's said, really, and again, we, again, I brought this up the other week. We have all these, you know, I went, I've been all around the world. I've been, it's all quite lucky there. And it's, it's such a shame that it's always along the line, it always ends in violence. And it, well, it did end in violence. You know, one thing I've got to watch when I go out, I try never to drink when I go out. I'm what you call a thingy uh, alcoholic. Was it a private alcoholic? I can sit indoors and drink on my own. But I realise if I go out, I can play up. And I don't want, you know, I love being around my friend Bryn. Bryn's like a proper counsellor, teetotaler for years. And what I love, because no way am I going to misbehave in front of this fella. He's given me, he give me everything I could ever ask for. Just his law is unbelievable. And it's like, so one thing I'd never do is play up, or I hope to God I wouldn't play up in front of him. So that's why I like, when I, I love being around, we'll go out for dinner, great, I'll drink spiking water. But now I can go indoors and drink a bottle of vodka like that, bang. And then it's like, it wouldn't affect me in it. But that's why, I think that's why I've got to be careful there because I'm an addict. <laughs> People shit themselves when you talk about addicts. What do you mean you're an addict? What, a drug addict? Or you know, you take drugs or drink or something? No, but I'm an addict in life. One, one, was it one's not enough, uh, one's too many in a thousand's not enough just for today. Because <laughs> it's like, whatever I do now, I want to get back into sports. Now, I haven't, people say, oh, you put a bit of weight on Dom. Or, you know, you're, I said, listen, I box with 28 years. Leave me alone. It's like, well, he gives me up with the likes of when I dig Ricky out. Ricky out was a, Best, probably one of the best fights we've ever had in England, right? He's a, he's every, he's the people's champion. You could not meet a nicer fella. And then people dig him out when he see he's done his hard work. All right, I know he goes, he's, he's got videos in me in Tenerife. All right, you know, people shouldn't be taking him videos. But let the geezer, geezer used to make, killed himself to, to entertain us as a fighter. You know what I mean? And you get people quick enough to, and you know what always kills me, these, these keyboard warriors. Mm. They're so quick. You got a problem with me. You're so quick to dig me out on the thing, eh? Come say it to my face if you've got any arsehole. I went in again, <laughs> we said this before, and someone bought it again. They don't interview we've done before. When I got ironed out, if you want, and I, you know, I was in this bar and also I was in the toilet, and these three fellas they're, they're, they're in the toilet and they're going, Oh, that negus is in the bar, blah, blah, blah. He goes, Yeah, he got white ironed out, didn't he? But I'm actually in the toilet having a piss. And they don't realise I'm no, no, but people in, and I walk in their face and I open the door and went, All right, fellas, I went like that and I went no you're right you're right but what do you mean I'm right I said you're right I did so I deserved it and, and, and it was like their face like what the <laughs> fuck and, like, and it was because I've got again going back to that I've got no problem i become you know I was an addict in life mm. you know we'd go out I just remember going down the bar this bar was open at 10 o'clock in Bucker still <laughs> I'd be there at 10 every, but I wouldn't leave there till 11 or 12 o'clock at night sit all day do all my business in there and it was just you know he was just a load, can I be honest, he was just a load of old bollocks. I look back now and, you know, I, I am I, do I regret anything? You know, the boxing I regret, but I can't regret too much because I would not be here today with the daughter I've got because we, we've all gone down this road, you know, and I'm great, you know, I'm grateful for the people that stuck by me I'm, and I'm grateful for the people that have left me because it's like you have to, you have to go like weed them out, don't you? Weed all the goodies out from the baddies. And it's like again, I'm, I've got an handful of handful of uh, friends. I mean, we went to IB for the other month. My, I went for my, my my mate. How lucky am I? You know, he took me out to IB for. Um, there's about seven of us. We had the best time, mm. and it was so you know. And we're sitting there, but every day we're sitting there, and they're like, they want to hear stories. You know, I mean, you, you would have loved it to be honest with you. But I'm telling them stories I could never tell you. But in, in, it is, it's, and I said it in the interview. It was such a shame. The majority all end. In violence, oh. and it is because I can I be honest. I know you ain't known me for long, but I ain't like that. Mm. I was just so lost, and all I ever wanted to be, you know, and, it, and I haven't been lost so much. I mean, obviously, like splitting up for Nick ruined me a little bit, and it's just the way it is. And you know, I think we mean it. We're just two alike. We clash, and it's like all I ever want to do. Right, if, if if there's potential wives out there, <laughs> you know what I mean. All I want to do is feel wanted. I want to be the first thing and the last thing you think of at night time. Mm. And I'm the, easiest per I'm the easiest person to be played because all I want to do is be loved. 
and that all we want, ain't it? This, you know, this. I ain't no gangster. I've never been a gangster. You know what? I was a bloody idiot. You know, because my weakness was, my weakness was always my strength. My, I was so quick to help. Oh, I remember being in a nightclub once. I met a fella. <coughs> yeah, so you're getting another one out me here. Yeah? I met a fella up up north somewhere, and I was start doing a bit of work for him. Only like bits of collecting his rent. He had a car. And I remember. I'm not about years ago. He had this old. Uh, RS2000 mix and I started re uh, doing it all up for him like the shell painting it and I mean this week and he took me out as a treat you know he was quite a bit of a face in his town we go into a nightclub anyway these people he's had a, I don't know he's had a bit of grief with this little firm up there you know what he's like small town mentality or he's, I don't know the Joneses brothers or the Smith brothers or whatever there's about six of them all interbred ain't they they've all got funny eyes and red dance <laughs> and their feet are stuck together but well, this is what he like in these little villages I turn up Billy Big Bollocks, and I'm like, yeah, like, I'm from, I'm from the East End, don't really care. So we go to this nightclub, and all of a sudden we go to the bar, and all of a sudden I'm sitting there and talking, to, and I don't know, this little firm had turned up, and I don't know, my mate's sitting down on this, they have these sofas there, and I'm sitting there, bar, and mate, no one knows who I am. All of a sudden they start digging him out, because I go mad, bing, 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 all of a sudden everyone's flying about, and I mean, this geezer come up to me, and he's short, stocky geezer, he was a bit of a lump, and he had this Mohican. And he looked like the white version of Mr. T. But he come up to me, he goes, and I stood there, and I just have glasses then, and I put me in that light down, I cocked it back, and I said, how do you want to be, mate? And my friend Zach was, well, do you think my wanker, because I wear glasses? I said, let's go then, mate. And he stood there like that, and he just stood there and went, no, you're right, mate. And I went, yeah? He went, all right. And then he just walked off. My mate went, what the hell what happened there? And I'd known, known this guy for a couple of weeks, and I said, "That's that was my weakness, because I want to be your friend. And I was, and I was, wasn't so. I would never was. Would never say I was so used. But yeah, I got used, aren't I? But I got paid to be used, and that's all I was, you know. Again, uh, again, keep saying about my friend. My again, I'm so, we're so lucky with my friends. Really, am the ones that have stuck by me because, you know, I, mean, I, I didn't have to, you know, but they did. So, but if you look at programs like The Last Kingdom or The Vikings, and you go back hundreds of years. You would have been a hero because you would have wanted to be the toughest one of the toughest oh, gladiators. See, listen, I would have been this, and I, you know, might have gone. What you keep saying, my friend? You know, I'm I'm a gladiator, so and I'm I need an arena to perform in. So the arena's always nightclubs, pubs. We had this discussion before. Anywhere there was drink, drink and drugs. I mean, I was like, I'd walk in there, and they're like, you know. But then I keep saying it. I become someone I didn't like because I could look at someone now and go. Nine times out of ten, when you look at someone, you go, well, I don't really like that, Ben. It's what you don't like about yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's really true, because I'd bowl in somewhere. I could walk in a pub, and people go, oh, Dom's in here tonight. Oh. But also, what I did for certain people, and they know what I did, I actually kept violence out of their places. Because I'd be in a bar, and they'd see me sitting there, where people a bit, they'd walk along, and they go, oh, let's go in here, and they want to take a liberty. they go, well, better not then, Dom's in here tonight. Or it'd be, I'll get a phone call, pop down so and so he's had a bit of trouble with so and, so. and most of the, uh, the up and coming boys, I knew them all. So I'd walk in there and they'd go, no, 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 leave it tonight. Leave it tonight. Or they'd be dormant now. And then because you knew them, you'd always back them up. Not that I had to, but you'd they'd always. So somewhere along the line, they always, someone got something out of me than, more than I got out of them. And. Yeah, he said, yeah, I wouldn't go. I would have been all right as a gladiator, I reckon, wouldn't I? You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I look like Russell Crowe. No, I've got, I look more like Emu. You know? <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. So, so, what you've not talked about is your job keeping the fighters apart at the weigh-ins. What was that like? That's been great. I mean, I've I've done that since. I mean, the first job I ever done was when George Foreman came over and worked with uh, e box Terry Anderson. That, that was. 1990, I think that was, and I've always done it. Always been one of the jobs I've fallen back on. I mean, I always remember the, you know, the famous one was what's it called, uh, Nathan Cleverly and the Tony Bellew. I remember Tony playing up, and I actually picked Tony up and walked him out, like the back. And I said, "Oh, come on, Tony!" He goes, "No, you're right, mate. You're right. I knew you like." But I made so many friends through that. I mean, going with the boxing. I mean, listen, you know, I was all right. I was box. I was doing that security before I boxed. So then it was so I, I knew everybody before before I turned pro, the border control things like that. I mean it's like I so said one of the greatest jobs I've ever had, and I felt such a traitor to Ricky Atten was looking after Costa the Zoo when he came over, and we were in for three week or nearly three weeks from the day he landed to the day he went back, and like we got a fellow there called uh, Ron Nash, and um, Kerry, 
and they were out in Australia. I'm still friends with them today. I keep promising I'm going to come over there. I scare them one day. I'm going to phone them up, be at the airport, come and pick me up. Again, you know, that was a great job. I mean, like, you know, you, we were backstage with the likes of, like, Enzo McRonelli. Now, that's a great fight. And um, I'm, and I always remember I bought his kiddie when he had his, his, his boy was born. I bought his kiddie the, his first Scalectrix, little <laughs> Scalectrix, like Galzaghi, things like that, the Ricky Attens. You know, I mean, I, was, I remember being being at the weigh-in for Nigel Benz fight with uh, Malinga at Newcastle. Then I was up and coming. Now, I'll tell you, one little story. Good. Now, this is a funny story. That <coughs> when it was me, Johnny Farstands, and Will Irish. And, and I, I, you know, I've got to be careful what I say, because, you know, I ain't racing. But now, Will Irish, black guy, good-looking guy, dead ringer, dead ringer for Nigel Benn. So we go, we go, up, to, uh, <coughs> we go up to Newcastle, they had the weigh-in. So the day that no, 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 Nigel's come in, I think uh, Peter DeFreitas says, oh, he's, he's a good pal of mine. Uh, they weigh Nigel in, so he goes off. So what normally happens is after the weigh we have all, all day or night to ourselves, and we start work next day, normally about one o'clock. So we go to this bar, I think it's called Lucy's, down in uh, uh, Newcastle, on the, on the, was it the lock or what they called it, the, the dock. Really, and it's happening in this bar. Oh, my God, it's happening. So me and Johnny and Will were down. you got... Uh, Bobby Ches, great fighter. He was doing a, uh, the talk over for the American, I think, the American TV they had on. Uh, who else is there? Uh, Glenn McCorry. Everyone, oh, everyone's turned up this bar. So, of course, you've got this Will Wives. Now, he's a dead ringer. He used to have the little ringlets on it. And I think that's what he used to do because everyone thought he was Nigel Ben. So, we're at the bar and he's ordered a bottle of champagne, giving it Charlie Big Bananas. <laughs> Wearing such a like, I've got girls around me. I'm like, you know what I mean? It's only because the, they think we'll be Nigel. <coughs> anyway, so what happens? We end up going back, go to work, do the show. Poor old Nigel. I think that Nigel, uh, Malinga beats him on points. We end up going back to the bar. You know, this is like, you know, and he goes, hear these people. Now, not uh, we'll never come back with us. It's me and you should have heard these people. Ain't Nigel Ben, no wonder he fucking lost. He was in here last night drinking champagne and this and, <laughs> and it weren't. He was poor old Will. <laughs> anyway, another one. So we were with, uh, we were doing a personal security for Prince Nazim. We were now printing that Naz couldn't meet a nicer guy. You know, everyone keep he gets bad press now, but he don't. This guy's um I don't think you to see many fighters like him. He was a phenomenon, you know, kid could bang so hard, you know. <laughs> Flash as you like. But he, this kid, he could back up what he said. So this was the night where he's fighting um, Paul Ingle. So we're up there, we're with him we're outside his room. Anyway, so this night, he, I think it was the night, I've done the weighing. So this night we get a call, we're outside his room. White boys, get ready, he wants to go out. This is the night before the fight. About, excuse me, about 11 o'clock. So I get in, I'm, I'm lucky enough, because I always used to get with, like, we'd be in the same car as him, limo and... So we're, we're driving, we're, we're driving to Piccadilly, Manchester. What's the one that wants to play pool? So no, so we go, we pull outside this, this, this pool. So Kevin, Kevin Camp, he was, he, he was all, Kevin, he was a top, top minder for, uh, for Naz. He actually owned uh, a top guy with, he was the main man, he was John Camp, his brother. You know, so there was, there was us, I think it was me, Johnny Gardner with Naz. Kevin's gone up to the thingy. He goes, we've got a fella down, says, wants to use a snook wall. Who is it? Prince Nazim. Bloke went, yeah, all right, mate. I said, listen, Prince Nazim's downstairs, but he wants it on his own. Now you've got like 15 people playing pool. So you imagine what the Manx are like, yeah, all right. You're right. But there was two There was two sides to this snook wall. <laughs> one was like, I think, one was like, a, if I remember right, one was pool and one was snook, and I can't remember what one was. I think we end, I think we got stuck with the pool side. So it's a pool. Naz comes up, so we've had to put a little thing there. So he's walking, it's splits in half. We're like, we're all sitting there, he's playing pool. And the guys are coming over. Oh, can we get an autograph? <laughs> and we look for sorry, man. Look, he just wants to be left alone. He's got his fight tomorrow. Because how we used to train, he used to train. So he's fighting at eleven o'clock at night. He'd always be up at eleven, which is a good thing. So you're acclimatised. You know. So we're sitting there. So, you ain't got to get this bar. I like, guess what happens? We're sitting there. Someone comes up the stairs. George Foreman comes up. Says, comes in. Hello, now. Blah blah blah. Like okay, you know. Tommy Earns comes up the stairs comes in there because they've been told that Naz is playing pool now Tommy Earns is, is fighting the next day so you had so you had a group of them coming there was I think I can't remember if Ryan Rose turned up but it was a group so you had Tommy Earns you had George Foreman Emmanuel Stewart turned up these and I'm like we're sitting there going 
fucking hell. So I never ever got photos. I was never into pictures. I should have. But my mate got a picture of all of them together. It's the maddest, surrealist thing here. The night before this massive fight, you've got all these top 10 fighters in the world all playing pole. Then you had uh, Sean Ryder turn up at the Happy Mondays with his girl, was it Roetta or something? They all turned up. It, it was just, I'm sitting there going, Am I seeing this? Am I? <laughs> but it was a met, But you could have not met nicer people. These are these. This I'm saying that's why the boxing world's been always been good to me because you know always saying you always get found. If you're a liar, you get found out in this sport. But it was never like that. You know, I mean, they're all so good. And there's people like you know, going really lucky. You know, like there's obviously Ricky out as a pal of mine. I've got Mike Jackson. He's his he's his thingy uh, lead trainer kind of thing. All these people I've known, and I can phone them up now and just, hello, mate, what's going on? How are you, how are you doing today? You know, and it's like the likes of, you know, people like there's a, a good pal of mine called Mickey Theo. I don't know if you, he's got this thing going on with John Fury at the moment. He wants to try and fight John, and I try not to get involved in that side of him, but he, uh, with Mickey, again, these were people that have all stood by us, like with Mickey, he's like, people don't realise he's been in the boxing game, was he 40 years, 30 years, boxed every day. Things like that. So people just think he's this bodybuilder, but he ain't. I mean, I remember seeing him spar like he spar with Mark Potter and things like that. And when I went, when I after the incident, I had here, uh, you know, when I got well, I got chopped up, I started using his gym, KO Jimmy Wolfham. And I went to Mick, look, Mick, just letting you know, I've got a bit of a stigma around me at the moment. Can I use the gym? He goes, use the gym because I sponsor you. So I've never had no problems there. But to see, when I used to see him spar, we were always so close to sparring, but. In some ways, I'm glad we never did because he was never going to take a backward step and nor was I. But now, he was so close. He's such a good pal of mine. We always meet on a Sunday and I have, I have my little bit of Mickey, like, he he talks sense. He really does talk sense, you know, so I have to normally see him once a week, you know. So Bella calls him Uncle Mickey, which is quite nice. So, yeah. so you've got two books out. You've got Out of the Shadows and Into the Light with Jamie Boyle, of course, and that links in the description box. So the process of writing these books, was that good for you mentally? Yes and no in certain ways because it was good. It's like, what they call it, diluting the situation. We have to dilute, you know, don't we, di we dilute things to get them off our chests. But then also what it did, it opened things up again, do you know what I'm saying, brought things back. You know, we were, certain things, it's like, no way have I come on this programme today to open up old wounds or things like that. You know, it, it's, I'm just saying, listen, think that side of my life 15 years I feel like I've been in rehab for 15 years that's over you know you know what I do for a living I, I do a you know, concierge receptionist and I do a bit of house, house guarding if you want but I mean the book itself was quite the second book in a way it's a shame because Nick Nick's never read it but if you ever read it it's, it's a lot about to do where I failed her in our relationship you know I mean well I, you know I wish I could have put things right you know, and I do, it still breaks my heart today in a way because in some way she's probably one of the only women I've ever loved and still, like, she's, she's given me the best gift I could ever have. And it's so it's so hard because we, you know, where we talk something like, well, we do, we do, but then we clash so much. And that's why I said to you earlier, all I ever want to be is someone's first and last thing they think of, you know, and I just want I just want to feel wanted. You know, I don't, you know, and a lot of it between me and Nick was, a lot of it was mine. I put everybody else first before her because I thought, well, we got years to go yet. And it's, when I say about making hay while hay lasts, I say, when I can earn them, man, let me do it. You know, and it's always, well, you don't want to spend time here. It was never like that. I was just thinking, let's put some money in the bank. And it, I think it backfired a little bit and it shot me in the arse a little bit, didn't it? But, you know, we've met a game with me. Once you get to know me, nothing's about me. I don't, you know, it's not as if I'm flesh. You come live, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough where I live now, you know, and I've got a nice car kind of thing, but it ain't about me. It's not about me. It's about everything to do now is, is for other people and like for my daughter for what's coming so and there's also been two tv programs i mentioned danny dyer i'll put the link in the description box below this video if you're watching this and you want to watch his danny dyer but the other one was it called britain's underworld yeah britain's underworld was and that the same thing or is it yeah yeah i mean but they they got the nitty gritty of it all they got me when i come out of the hospital when i've just been chopped up i had a fight and i lost that and that to me it was like that's that's real life not even you know you know, if we can sit in, if there's any, you know, budding producers out there saying fancy doing something with us, but we need to have, I want to have an happy ending. 
You know what I mean? It's like, you know, I want to I run off into the, in the sunset with Bella and perhaps a new wife and a dog or something. You know what I mean? You go, come on, let's go. Aah. You know, I just want to be happy. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it could we have a laugh? Of course, I'm, listen, I'm not moody. I'm, you know, I'm a moody git, but <laughs> I'm not like doom and gloom. But yeah, just saying, you know, let's, let's, you know, let's put a spin onto it. Let's put something nice. Let's, come on, I think I deserve a break somewhere <laughs> along the line. I mean, listen, I paid my dues and I paid my dues and people, and they know I paid my dues and I've, I've apologised to people that have, have put like this. There's a lot of people out there now see my face every time they wash their teeth in the morning, what I've done to them. You know, and I'm not happy about it. I'm not proud of it. And I'm going to listen, I'll say open because my daughter's sitting there and I'm not proud of it. That's why I'm trying to put <clears throat> a different thing to this. This ain't me trying to say, oh, I'm the hardest. You know, no way if I set it going, I'm this tough geezer. I'm saying, I've fucked up. I made a lot of mistakes, you know, and I just want to, I'm not putting them right, but just for me, this is, is this is, this is my, like, uh, what they call it when you go out, like, confession kind of thing, it's not. So can people still watch Britain's Underworld? Is that on YouTube well, or that's, anything? Well, uh, that's quite an odd thing to get hold of. I mean, I'm try, I'd love to get hold of that myself, only because that's proper gritty. It's proper, you know, you see, I've lost my fight, I lose my dad, I get chopped up. You never know. I probably said the winning lottery ticket and I lost that as well. You know what I mean? But, you know, but they, they, you know, that's probably, you know, but they go, what I can say about that documentary, it, that's, you want something hardcore. If you can go, that's, oh, that's, that's people that they're like this. You ain't going to get no lower than that. So it is, and it is what it is. So. so Jamie described you as a big, scary bird to look at, but a broken <laughs> boy, emotionally damaged inside. Do you think that's correct? You won't not get hold of him. <laughs> no, no. Listen, can I be honest with you? He ain't far from the truth. Listen, I, I, you know, my mum and dad are gone. You know, I miss my mum. I miss, oh my God, I miss, you know, I don't know if your parents are still alive. So I miss my mum terribly because the way my mum went, she went in weeks. We didn't realise. I mean, we thought we had time, you know, time. You know, my brother's not well. He's got, you know, since he's, he's got cancer. And we keep, I would do this. I said, it's not about next. It's about doing things now. Because, every, you know, we've all got a bucket list, I think. But see, my, my dad, again, my dad, my dad was a nuts. He was great, he was. He would have loved, he would have adored my daughter. He would have adored Bella, you know. And it's like, <laughs> he was, you know, he wasn't an odd man, but he was he was straight with us. He brought us out the best way he could. You know, when you grow up and they go, well, I blame the parents. I blame the parents. No, my mum and dad were great. We, they taught us uh, manners, doing the right thing. But, you know, dad, you know, Dad was 50 when he had us, so when he went, he, I think was I was 32, so, yeah, it was just before Bella was born, so I was gutted, gutted, I like, never got to see Bella, and then, of course, my mum, mum was ill, and I feel we flogged her off a little bit, she went back to Italy, because that's where, believe it or not, I'm half Italian, my brother looks slippery, he's got hair and everything, you know what I mean, that's it, like black hair, and I, look, I, look, I say I look like my mum, she was bald as well, but yeah, people yeah. won't get that joke, yeah. will they, but, no, but it's, uh, yeah, no, I feel like with mum, we, we flogged off a little bit. She went back to Italy. It was always, all the family looked up, the kind of thing. I mean, then we went out over there and we we basically caught. I remember being on the plane. We get a call to look, you better come. We knew she wasn't well. We were told at Christmas she was cancer about a year. We got a call saying uh, we to come over. And I got a phone call in the morning. She better get over here. So um, me and my brother, I remember we, it, it kills me to say this, but we were. We were at Stansted Airport, and I still remember having a glass of wine my brother. And I'm saying, look, mum's pulling up. You know what mum's like? They're over here, right? You better go over here. You know, so we get this phone call, sitting there with a glass of wine. And I'm saying to my brother, look, if mum's pulling our leg again, I have to tell her, because I'm losing money. I'm self-employed. Having time at my work, can't keep paying the rent, things like that. Of course, get up the plane. My cousin goes, oh, by the way, your mum died an hour ago. <sighs> God, talk that. And I still remember phoning my mate up. I'm phoning B up. And B goes, there is she. I was quite like, basically, she's gone, mate. And we were so shocked. We were so, you know, and one of the worst things I think I've ever had to do, right? I remember walking into the flat and everyone's there, all my cousins there, probably just turning family, you know what I mean? And she's laying on the bed and she's, I've got a light there. And I've got mental. My brother, my brother's, well, my brother's, my brother, but he's quite, I think he's quite cold compared to me. I'm, I think that's what makes me so volatile. I'm very, uh, very sensitive. And I, you know, I'm a cry, I'm a cry or whatever, but I remember seeing her, you know, so we sat there. And I'm in bits. My, my auntie's got hold of me, trying to calm me down and things like that. So was, we're sitting there. So 12 o'clock comes. And everyone's gone. Just my cousin Giovanni, he's there. And I think it's Marilio. <coughs> and what they do, they open the door at 12. They open the front door and the back door to let the spirit run through. He's very old-fashioned. But no, so <laughs> that's me. The funny, if it's funny, we're sitting there overnight. So me and my brother got a couple of bottles of wine from across the pot of potent homemade stuff. And we're a bit pissed. And me and my brother talking. 
Now they've got a spine with me, brother, and my mum's laying in the bed like got his dead, but she's on the bed. And we like think, looking at that door, going, I wonder if that door handle's going to open, she's going to come out. Or my brother's going, she opened the door and have a look. I said, no way. We were, we were so scared. Mm. But I just remember then, so we're sitting there. So what they do the next day, they do an open day. So all your family come in, they go and pay their respects. It's all, I mean, she's just sitting there and there's nothing of her. The cancer's really gone white right through her. Mm. Maddest thing I've ever had to do. So my cousin's gone, I'm about that. Coffee, coffee. I said, yeah, okay. I said, Andy, I'm out coffee. So come, we've got, come, going to get some coffee. So he takes us up, you know, round a corner, takes up to his industrial site. You ain't coffee, it's a bloody coffin. Go up and pick a coffin. Mm. <coughs> and they don't muck about over there. It's normally the next day burial or whatever they do. Because it's the weekend, we, they said Saturday, whatever it was. So the Monday, we've got a booked in for cremation. So they come in on the Sunday and they take her out. And what they do, they basically put, put her in a coffin, they drive around the street. It's a little tiny Maori, most people, on the Amalfi Coast, got me Nori Maori, most, nothing's changed. So we're sitting on this uh, thing, so they get the coffin, and all of a sudden, it's my uncle's there, like my mum's brother. The worst thing I think I've ever had to do in my whole life is that she's laying on the bed, and my uncle says to, to my brother, get her feet up, pick her feet up. And I've had to pick her up. Do you know what? It's like a bag. It's like a bag of sugar. And I put this this woman up and I had to put her in this coffin and we were sitting there and it's a you know, killed me. Fucking killed me, it did. And I remember that. Mm. So I remember that for the rest of my life. And I remember putting the lid on and we went back and all I could ever say, you know, they say if you could see your mum now, which I'd say, Mum, I'm so sorry. I'm mm. so sorry. I should have done things so different. And that's what make that's what makes me angry. That's what makes me angry. But it's like, she, you know, me and my dad were really close. You know, that's what hurts me. But me and my mum went, because I always had that, re I had that resentment towards my mum because what she, she left my dad when my, they split up when my dad was 74. You think in that time of life, it's over. But I just remember, uh, you know, I said, um, I said, my dad, what's going on? I've just split. I'm like, oh, your mum, she's going through this midlife crisis and stuff. And people were getting into my mum about getting divorced. And my dad said, don't listen to your friends. You want to get divorced? And all of a sudden, all the hard work, my dad was on the print, all on print for years. So he had all these uh, widow pensions and stuff like that, you know what I mean? And my dad's saying, you you, you divorced me, you ain't going to get nothing. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, even when my dad died, I'll give you his truth, my mum was there when my dad died uh, with her fella, and he went a bad for it. Was, we called him Shakespeare, because he, he was, he, was he, he, sad thing, he died, I think, last year, actually. My brother was still close with him. <coughs> but... And going at the end, see, my mum was quite lucky. My mum ended up going to Italy. She took the, all the pension and stuff with her. My dad sold the house. So, of course, when he died, my mum got his money as well. Mm -hmm. So, it's like, but if I could say now, you know, say, oh, mum, you know what? I'm so sorry. You know, you know, they say, we're going to meet him on the other side. I'm quite scared to see my mum again. She's going to kick me up the arse and say, but uh, I'm sure she's looking down proud of what you're doing now, Dominic. Well, I really hope so. <laughs> I can't do nothing else. Mm. <laughs> so, what, what positive plans have you got for the future then? Just you know, I'm I want to. I'm 50 years old now. I'm still here. I want to buy an house or buy a saint so I can leave for Bella. Uh, just having, just going forward now. Just going, you know. Just go, you know. How it's going from now. I was 18 months ago to now. I'm such a different person. I mean, in such a, such a different place. We've come full foot, like full forward. You know, I'm hoping to do another book. Hope opening to do it. I'll speak to Jamie about it. Two ways I like to do it, through the eyes of my daughter or through the eyes of other people. Just saying, like, you know, because, and I said before, they're not going to be nice stories. I don't expect them to. You know, because back in the day, I was a selfish git. I did what I wanted, didn't care, you know, took the piss out of people. And so, you know, it wouldn't hurt me for people to put the darker side, you know, I mean, then, and I, you know, there's just people I've met, and they go, oh, do you remember when you, you, you know, you've done this and done? I said, yeah, I'm sorry about that. And things have changed. And things, is, and I can see people now that I haven't seen for years and go, they're actually pleased to see me, especially when she's with me, because I go, because I'd never play up. You know, don't be wrong, I think we had this conversation another day, I think I only played up once in, well, in front of my adult once when someone didn't bring my breakfast on time. So that was, that was, that was a, yeah, that was quite a funny thing. And I remember coming out of the cafe and Bella's going, you all right, Dad? I said, because I wouldn't have this food. I said, take your own. She goes, you all right, Dad? I said, yeah, but I'm really starving. I, you know what I mean? I was so hungry. But anyway, yeah, you know, I just want to, Keep going the way I'm going. I just want to fill this. So I've got this void there. Just but each day it seems to be getting smaller. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm getting stronger every day. Just you know, I need you know, 
there's like I still need to do a lot of work on myself though you know what I mean it's like admitting when you're wrong understanding when, and what makes you do the things we do you know and I, I need to keep myself in a good place you know because it's so easy for me just to drop back again you know it would be I mean on the phone call I could be back in the middle of it all so but it's, it's not what I want and it's not me anymore I just you know I seem to be more of a mediator now more than anything I still get people say oh, I've got you up with so and so and it'd be like uh, I said well don't talk to me about it. I said, yeah, what do you want me to do about it? It's, you know, it's just how it is now. But. Earlier on, you said that you, were, you wasn't a very good speaker. You've come in here today uh, for two hours and you've been really charismatic and, well, I'm and, and you animated. Enjoyed it. I'm, 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 you, really enjoyable. I'm sure the people watching this are buzzing right now from your story, but you've also had these important messages about mental health and the ego. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in, in summary then, to the young people watching this, Maybe some of them are going through things, de depression and stuff. What what would you say to them? Well, listen, what I say, it, 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 we're not always going to have good days. It doesn't hurt to admit you're having a bad. I get this thing. I'm I'm being brought up in a society back in a like I so I'm fifty now. Back in this mental health thing, we didn't have none. We'd be put yourself together. What's the matter with you, idiot? You know what I mean? Like you know you you know we're we're men. You know, see me had, had me a couple of, you know going a couple of times here. I'm not ashamed that. I'm not ashamed to see people. But that's what makes me so volatile, though, because I can get upset, but then all of a sudden, when a flip of a switch, I can go the other way. And that's what I know. And there's certain things I know about myself. Now I'm telling <laughs> if one message I'll get out there, egos and pride are the two biggest killers out there. Because what it is, is only, again, my, again, what my friend, my mate, Brian always, again, I would have been, I wouldn't be here without my friends. And it's like, big, you know, they're going on a Friday night, and something said, your ego gets dented. Well, see, I was running people, I'm a man of my word. So if I say I'm going to do something, I'm telling you I'm going to do it because that's all I've got is my word. And that's what I'm hoping that's what's got me this far down. Even though I've been a right prat sometimes and I've upset the wrong people and I've done this, I've done that, I've always been good to my word and I've always been loyal. My loyalty's got me through this far. And that's why I try and say to people, you know, the bad, it's very true, especially in this boxing world. Loyalty, you need, you know, what Mickey Duff said, you want loyalty, get a dog. That's so true in that world. But this world, I think for me now, has paid dividends. Because certain things have happened. My friendship with certain people have shown, and they've helped me out when I really needed it. <coughs> and, it and it's great. And it's, if I say to people, look, you know, don't be too hard on yourselves. It's like, it's hard. It's, it's so, especially what's going on at the moment, this COVID 19 thing. It's like, it's so hard out there at the moment. It's, you know, people are losing their jobs. People ain't getting no money. People are getting, or the, you know, this furlough thing. People are getting sacked. You know, this and it's going to get harder. It ain't going to get easier. And then what we're going to be careful is that robbers are going to start robbing the robbers because no one's got no money. And that's when it start. People start getting desperate. You know, and they're just trying to hold fire a little bit. It's like with people. You know, it doesn't hurt to talk when you're having a bad day. Talk to someone. You know, you know, you know, I feel sorry, so I keep saying this, I feel sorry at my daughter, because I unload on her quite a lot, especially about stuff we talk about, like her mum and things like that, and it's, you know, no way am I trying to, I would never put my daughter in the middle of something, but I also wanted to know the situation me and her mum are going through sometimes, so then she knows, not that she don't, listen, I'm a, I'm a dad, that's her mum, and that's how it is, you know, I don't, she don't need to take, take, Centerfold, but I just wanted to know what goes on sometimes. But sometimes I feel bad because I unload on her too much sometimes, and something she needs, she don't really need to know about. But that's how we are. Oh, man, that's a brilliant um, message there, as well as such an exciting and gripping story. Um, Jamie said about people who are emotionally damaged. I think we're all emotionally damaged. You look on Instagram, you see all these perfect lives. It's absolute bullshit. But it's, it's, everyone's going through fucked up shit, <laughs> especially right now with the lockdown. But this is what you're saying. Just, this media, I've got this, I've got that, I've got... But all these people ain't happy. That's what I'm saying. Listen, I might have the news kind of... I might, I ain't, I'll be honest with you, I'm not happy. I'm not, oh, my God, I wish I was happy. I told you, the only thing that makes me happy is, is my daughter. I'm happy. I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm in a lot better place than I've been for years. But out of sheer hard work, knowing what I want, let's go forward, we're going to do this. You know, the greatest time you'll ever see me smile again, again is when I'm with my daughter or when I'm in. I have to be careful where I put myself. You you know, what's the old saying? When, you, when you're in the sewer long enough, you get to spot the rats. So and if you hang about with dogs, you get fleas. So I make sure I want to be around winners because winners breed winners. And that's how it is now. And that's, I put myself with only good people. I'm trying to install it in my daughter about <laughs> I want to have a, an, not such education, but I want to have a good career. So she doesn't have to fall back on things she doesn't need. I want her to be independent in this world. 
You know what I mean? Because I don't want her having, having to fall back on like you have a, uh, how to put it? You, I don't want my daughter owning anybody anything. You know what I'm saying? So again, when I get, if I can get to 66, I was working out the other day, 66, Bella will be 32. So if I go by the time I'm 66 and then she's sorted out and she's in, going in the white right place, then I've done my job. You know, I'm, I'm afraid this, I'm probably never going to have to, I'm going to have to keep working about an hour before they bury me. You know what I'm saying? Because I've never, everything I've lived was for today. But now I know there's a tomorrow. But another important lesson: the, the the people you hang out with determine your future. So if you're hanging out with winners, you're going to be successful. Brilliant, brilliant. If you're hanging out with gangsters and, and killers, you're going to end up with an axe in your head. Thank you. So that's yeah, ruined that's, my, that's, ruined that's... my answer. I used, have, I used to have a perm before, you know what I mean? I feel I've got more ears on my chest and I've got my head now. But no, listen, it's, but also let's have some fun out there. Yeah, everything's doom and gloom. I mean, <clears throat> I I can't. I'm fed up watching film. Don't you? I love a good action film. But so I watched a film the other day, don't like it's called The Secret, where 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 you dare to dream or say. It's on Netflix, it's got Kate Holmes in it and and it was just such a soppy film. But it was a lovely film. Because I'm fed up like I mean, don't get me wrong, me and Bella watching Halloween two, the old one. I had to turn it off I was, I was get get myself scared. Like I drive around my mate's property sometimes and he's got a forest. And now why do I want to see what's Halloween? All of a sudden you go and you'll see a bloke with a white mask on, because I'm knocking you down, mate. I'm gonna see I'm talking to you, I'm knocking you down, mate. But it's like <coughs> but it's just mad, ain't it? It's just bad there, people. It's, you know, we need like to die watching only fools and horses. Mm. It can't be, but it's just something a bit of comedy. <laughs> it's just something that makes you laugh. Or then you thought something, what's the other program? What's the other a bit of that afterlife with Ricky Gervais yeah but he's got a flip a boat and I, it always makes me cry a bit when he's got his dad sitting there mm. and he goes I love you dad and he goes puff but that's my dad that was exactly how my dad was yeah. he was I was I was 26 when I, well, I just wanted to an area title and I put my arm around him we moved him down to a mobile home, home mobile home place and I put my arm around him I said I love you dad and that was the first time he hugged me back when I was 26 and I love you too because when we were kids we put go hey, you know we were all straight and all like mucking about because you couldn't say you love each other back then but I do I'm very you know I'm very again gifted to people I love you know what I mean I'm, there's an handful of people I love you know what I mean and I truly and I'm and I'll get off the phone to my friends I say, I love you mate because tomorrow's never Tomorrow's never gifted, is it? Today's, we're here today. You know, I want to say to people like, you know, I say now and I think, I love, Bryn, I love you, mate. You you saved my life. Emery, oh my God, without you guys, I'd never be here. You mean my daughter, you know, and I'm, I'm so thankful I'm still here and I never went to prison because I'd, I'd never, I'd last about a week in prison. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm gifted with certain people out there, you know what I mean? I had this thing the other day, there's so many people... I can, like my mate Gary, my mate Ian, this one, Mickey Fair, all these people, Bobby Wilcox. There's so many people I, I owe so much to, but there's only an handful that have only ever been there. Do you know what I'm saying? And I'm just, that's all I'll say. Look, thanks, guys. Thanks for, you know, thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for, again, thanks for my friends, you know, and this, this, you know, let's just keep going the way I'm going. You know what I mean? It's like, and just people leave me alone. Because I'm, one thing I'll tell you now, I'm, you know, so about your change. I ain't changed, I've just got wiser. So if you think anybody thinks I'm a pussy or whatever, that I know why, but I just know with every action comes a reaction there. So it's got to be worth the time for me to vent my fury because oh my god, I'm still that same person, but I just know that with the with the state of the art things now that I can't get away with the things I got away with before, and that's why I'd rather just go to work and just leave me alone, you know. And that is more brilliant um, lessons there as well. So if you are watching this and you are going through something, reach out to the friends you trust, reach out to the family members you trust. You see these perfect lives on Instagram, but I guarantee they're going through shit as well. If you think I can't reach out to this person, I don't want to bother them. They might want to, they might be going through something that they want to share with you. So you got to express that and the love and the relationships and the friendships and that that's the meaning of life. Because like Dominic said, Tomorrow's not guaranteed. Anything could happen. You could lose those friends. You could lose those family members before you've reached out and told them how much you love them and what they mean to you. So people are going crazy because of this lockdown and, and fighting each other. And it's like imprisonment. People are locked down. Stress rises and people start fighting and stuff. And it's it's really um, causing a lot of mental illness and, and, and domestic abuse. So now it's more important than ever for love and humor and, and to accept those into your lives, like Dominic said. 
So thank you, thank you very much for coming on. <laughs> well, man. listen, anybody want it? Listen, anybody need an act out? You can get me in lots of films. I've got some friends of ours, that, that Nick Nevin. He's just come, the Rise of the Foot Soldier for the Tony Tucker story. Five, I should say. Like my mate Terry, uh, Terry Stone, great actor doing it out there. I've got, uh, what's it called? Dapper Laughs. Uh, was it Real Talk? Chazza. Chazza Real Talk. They're all, they're all having it. They're people that struggled. But, they, you know, you ever get on it there... Or they do a lot of Instagram stuff. Swissy Chaz, he does real talk. But Dapper laughs. Oh my God, I love, I love his stuff. But uh, you know, we're just, just thankful for people out there going. Look, you need any actors, you know, big bull kind of like <laughs> bear kind of geezer, you know. But true Cockney. But listen, so, just... so, so below this video is a description <laughs> box. If it's on your computer, <laughs> you see the description box. If it's on your computer, on your phone, just click the little down arrow, and the description box opens. And there's going to be links in the description box to Dominic's books. Are you on any, any social media or do you have a preferred no, way I'm, people I'm on, I'm, on in, I'm on Instagram, just uh, uh, Dominic Negus, but obviously uh, a lot of the stuff into the light on uh, the Facebook stuff, which yeah. uh, Jamie's, I mean, listen, I'm a Neanderthal. I can't even see the size of his fingers. You know, know, I mean, massive. You know, you know, what a waste. You know what I mean? <laughs> all, on, all on my hands. You know, I say to people, what's that number around your neck? What number? I said, the one I want to ring. You know what I mean? But no, no, it's all it's all cool. And it's, it's just, listen, Sean, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. I feel so gifted considering... Again, I've got an apology for Jamie because I disappeared as soon as the book came out. Again, we should have been such in a better place now, but it's yeah. just for me being, just had stuff going on. So I've got to thank Jamie for that. And just for the people that stuck by me, again, thanks for you. Let me on be on the show today, which is, you know, feel gifted. Feel very so, gifted. So we'll put moment. your Instagram link down there. So is that your preferred method of people getting hold of you is Instagram? Yeah, but or if not on the, on the Facebook, on the Facebook, uh, into the light thing, just put on there. Yeah. You know, because Jamie runs that for me again, because, I mean, don't get me wrong, I do, I, I'm one of them people, you want to talk, ask me a question. I said, when we did this thing, link the other day with this, uh, Jack Gregory, uh, what, I can't remember his name, thingy, uh, journalist he's called, something journalist. Uh, I just said, look, if you've got a nice comment, if you've got a comment, be nice, say, don't, don't put nothing negative, because I, you know what I mean? Wasting your time because you know it just, you know unless you're going to say it to my face and you know which is a probably you know you ain't really going to do that are you I mean because unless you know me you ain't going to say that are you I mean because oh, I ain't like that if you got no what's the old saying if you ain't got nothing nice to say then don't say nothing at all I mean not that you're going to hit me with a negative spot because I think I've been hit enough negative so things about positive now. <laughs> Get a life, trolls. We know you just need the hug. That's the bottom line. Yes, I just need a hug. Come, <laughs> come and give me some love. You know what I mean? That's going to happen in a second. So, before we go there, if you've enjoyed this video, please let us know in the comments section. Please, yeah. Pretty nice stuff only. Nice stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, subscription logo is in the bottom right hand corner. Huge thank you to all the new subscribers. Thank you for going down into our description box and checking out our socials, checking out Dominic's links, and we've got our donation links down there, our playlists. Uh, the, all right, give us a, give us a hug, big hey. Yeah. Right, good, mate. Brilliant, man. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thank you so much, mate. Thanks, John.